Sorry. I'll call this council meeting to order. And for this time, please uh, silence your cell phones, iPads, any other technological device you may have. And uh, we'll rise, if you're able, for the national anthem. Our home and native land True patriot love In all of God's command Captain Ross Tony Smart est une épopée, les plus brillants exploits. God keep our land glorious and free. Oh, Canada, we stand on God for thee. Oh, Canada, we stand on God for thee. She's a little, a little slower than us. <clears throat> At this time, I'll give our land acknowledgement. Niagara Region is situated on treaty land. This land is steeped in the rich history of the First Nations, such as the Haudenosaunee, the Haudenosaunee, and the Anishinaabe, including the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. There are many First Nation, Métis, and Inuit people from across Turtle Island that live and work in Niagara today. The city of Port Coburn stands with all Indigenous people, past and present, in promoting the wise stewardship of the lands on which we live. We have one proclamation this evening, Council, from Crime Stoppers, declaring Crime Stoppers Month. If I could have Councillors Hoyle and Beauregard move that. Any questions? All in favor, please raise your hand. That's carried. Adoption of the agenda. If I could have Councillors Aquilina and Elliot move the agenda. The only thing I'm going to change, Council, is um, I'm going to move the Mayor's report prior to the presentations, and I'll get into our presentations and then back to delegations. Any questions on the agenda or any other changes? All in favor, please raise your hand. And that's carried. Disclosures of interest. I have one disclosure of interest, for, or one counselor, for uh, Councillor Beauregard for items 9.7 and 9.8. Are there any further disclosures of interest? Okay. We have minutes, uh, three sets. I'm going to do these in block. If I could have Councillors Bruno and Bagu move uh, minutes for 7.17273. First one is the meeting of Council November 8th, 2022. Second is the inaugural meeting of Council November 22nd, 2022. The third is Committee of the Whole Budget December 7th, 2022. Questions on any of the sets of minutes? Seeing none, all in favor? That's carried. Uh, we have item 8, recommendations arising from the budget meeting. We have 8, 1, 8, 2, 8, 3, 8, 4, 8, 5. If I could have Councillors Danch and Bodner move those. They are the capital and related pro uh, project budget 2022-248, uh, the levy budget 2022-245, the rates budget 2022-246, the rate setting 2022-247, and proposed user fees and charges 2022-244. Questions on any of those? All in favor, please raise your hand. That's carried. The following items have been pulled for separate discussion this evening. Items 9.1, 9.5, 9.6, 9.7, 9.9, 9.10, 9.11, .9, and 9.14. Any other items that haven't been pulled? Seeing none, 
if I could have councillors Hoyle and Beauregard move the remainder of items, but I'm going to do these a little bit separately. I'm going to do 9.8 first for the councillors' um, conflict, and then we'll do the rest. So on item 9.8, uh, declaring the conflict is Councillor Beauregard. All those in favor? That's carried. And on the remaining balance of the items not withdrawn tonight, all those in favor? Well, that's carried. All right. Get into the mayor's report. So it was an honor uh, for myself and for all of incoming council to be sworn in by Madam Justice Teresa Madalena of the Ontario Superior Court on the evening of November the 22nd, right here in council chambers. After a welcome proclamation by town crier Tom Picard, we were honored to be led into the chamber by Piper Terry Dyson and a colored guard from the Royal Canadian Legion Branch 56. And we were also honored to be escorted by two members of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, Sergeant Tom Scarlett and Sergeant Nicole Noonan, by Niagara Regional Police Deputy Chief Bill Forty and Staff Sergeant Phil Ishkay, um, and by the Port Coburn Firefighters Matt Lannon and Curtis Wilcox, and by Linton Davies 79 Squadron Cadets. Soloist Rene Bisson led us in O Canada, and it was a ceremony of great significance, and we are all so proud, grateful, and humble to serve the City of Port Coburn for the next four years. And you can watch the ceremony in full on the City's YouTube channel. After the pomp and circumstance of the administration of our oaths, uh, we got right to work. At this time, I'd like to thank city staff and fellow councillors uh, for your cooperation and patience as we work through a busy couple of weeks of orientation. It's important we're all starting on the same page with the same information and have a thorough grasp of how things work and where things are going. I've had the pleasure of representing council at grand openings and business anniversaries, two of which occurred days after our swearing in. Owners Lisa and Ben Terryberry celebrated the grand opening of Portside Petals and Gifts on the first anniversary of taking over the former Arley's Florists on Clarence Street. Across the street is mixed martial arts champion Anthony Romero, who welcomed hundreds of clients and guests at his expansion of Genius Fitness and Martial Arts. We wish them well and thank them for doing business in downtown Port Colborne. Council salutes Luke Rowe and Amy Duffy, for coordinating one of the best parades we've ever presented. Thanks to so many staff from all departments who helped with the setup, and especially Dave Zabo, who put together our city float. Uh, Dave, great job. All the floats were well done. A lot of time and effort goes into these events, and we salute all the local businesses, organizations, and service clubs for their work and contributions to make our little lighted parade one of the best in Niagara. Thanks to Councillors Hoyle and Aquilina for walking the parade route with us, handing out treats to all the youngsters along the way and some not young, so youngster. <laughs> Our float featured enlargements of the uh, art I chose for more than two, from more than 200 submissions from Port Coburn Elementary School children, and we were thrilled to have the children ride in the lighted uh, float Saturday evening. Uh, we were pleased to have them here tonight. Uh, we are pleased to have them here tonight uh, to present them with their enlarged cards uh, of their art and to display in their homes or in their front lawns. Tonight we present a framed memento of their original work, and the card printed from the art, with an official plaque to thank them for participating in this annual project. We're so proud of all the children who contributed Christmas art, and we congratulate all of you. So at this time, I'm going to go to the podium. And I'll call up the students. So at this time, uh, if I could have Ellie Sismar, she's a grade 8 student from St. John Bosco. Is Ellie here? Come on up, Ellie. Good. Thanks for coming out. So, so this year we did something a little bit different. Normally, the mayor's card has been one card with a front uh, page uh, with one artwork, and then inside was a series of other uh, artwork that we chose. So we decided this year, uh, 
uh, Gail Todd and I, uh, my EA and Scott's EA, let's, let's really change it up, do something different. So we picked um, nine cards. Um, on every card is, is this big one here, uh, which you'll uh, hear about the person in a minute. It's actually got me in it, <laughs> which is pretty funny. Uh, but each, each of the students received their own card um, with their artwork on the front and then um, a little writing in the, in the inside. So this says presented to Ellie Sismar, grade 8 St. John Bosco Elementary School. It's a 2022 Mayor's Christmas Card Contest winner. Thank you. Can I look at this guy? I'm good. Parents can take pictures too if they want. Our family. Yeah, come on up. And we'll do a, we're going to do a group shot right after this. Yeah. If you want to go stand in front of your, yeah. you take that and then stand in front of your card up here. Perfect. Next we have Nash Kreiderman, grade two from Steel Street Public School. You look too big to be a grade two. <laughs> How you doing? Good. Good. So this is presented to Nash Kreiderman, grade two, Steel Street Public School for the 2022 Mayor's Christmas Card Contest winner. Congratulations. Thank you. Want to look at this guy? Thank you. If you want to take this and, and find your card, the big card up here, you can hang out of that and just go stand in front of it. Thanks. Next we have Aubrey Coros, St. John Bosco, grade five. Aubrey. And presented to Aubrey Coros, grade five, St. John Bosco Catholic Elementary School, 2022 Mayor's Christmas Card Contest winner. Congratulations, thank you. Oh, take a look, let's do this one first. And look at this big guy over here. <laughs> if you want to go stand in front of your card up there. Thanks. <laughs> Next we have Haley Moeller, grade 7, Oakwood Public School. Is Haley here? Next we have Miles Price, grade two, St. Therese Catholic Elementary School. How's Miles tonight? Good. You can come right up here if you want. Yeah, yeah. Okay, why don't we step over here where everybody can see us? Okay, big, big smile. Look at this big guy. Hello, right here, three, two, one. Very good. I'll bring over here. And I'll stay in front of you. What's yours? Is it heavy? Next is Zoe Reber, grade seven, Dwight Carter Public School. Hi, Zoe. Come right up, guys. Can I ask you to get one here? You should come closer. Gail says you always stand too far away. <laughs> I, got it. I got the zoom. One, two, three. Got it, thanks. Okay, if you want to go stand up by your car. Next we have Holly Redinger, 
Grade one, Oakwood Public School. Hello, Holly. Hi. How are you? Good. Good. Come on over here so we can get a good picture of you. Right there. There we go. She's my Just thinking all the toys. Just one more. Yeah. Ready? One, two, three. Click. There you go. Do you want to go stand by your card over there? Next is Natalie Walker, grade five, St. John Bosco. And then we have Adam Wyatt, grade two, St. Pat's. Not here. What's that? We didn't get the story on the Bill Steele card. Oh, I did say something. I thought you said there's going to be a story on that. No, I, well, when the girl, the girl's not here. Wasn't here. No. Oh, I'll do that in a second. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So again, we thank all the uh, students from across Port Colborne Elementary Schools that submitted this year. It was our biggest year ever. 
So to conclude my report this evening, our last council meeting for the year of 19, or 2022, on behalf of all of council and staff, uh, distance tonight for health and safety and the continuing fight against COVID, I send greetings to all of you at home and best wishes for a safe, healthy, and joyful Christmas. Please drive safely, slow down. Uh, let's all look out for our neighbors, and we'll see you at the Valley Center on New Year's Eve. That ends my report, and the regional councillor's not here this evening, but if anybody has any regional questions, I can take those. We just started to get into budget workshops, so there's not a lot of action going on at the region as far as meetings, <laughs> other than budget meetings. <laughs> Okay, so we have two delegations this evening. Our first delegation is uh, Janet Orem. It's a petition requesting to reduce the vehicle speed limit on Elm Street. Janet, if you want to come up to the podium here. There. Welcome. Thank you. Hello, good evening. My name is Janet Orham, and I live on Elm Street. I walk my dog on Elm Street every day in both directions, usually three times a day, so I am very aware of the traffic situation throughout the day. One day at the intersection of Main and Elm, while crossing the street with Brownie, my dog, the walk sign flashing, a speeding car with teenagers laughing at us turned in front of us, nearly hitting Brownie and I. Also, the apartment building on that corner has many senior citizens who cross the street throughout the day to go to the Avondale store on the corner. Some have walkers and some have canes. Some can't... Uh, some can't make, take the time uh, to cross within the, the allowed time. We need flashing pedestrian lights installed. I believe that we have more truck traffic on Elm Street due to the closing of the building at the, uh, the, of the bridge at Forks Road and adjustments have not been made. We need a large sign showing the speed limit and more than one. I have a nephew who lives on Elm Street and he tells me that when the large trucks drive by his house, his house rattles. Trucks coming down Main Street to make a right hand turn onto Elm Street at the Esso gas station at times turn so close to the gas pumps that it makes for an unsafe situation. The tire marks can be seen there on the curb where pedestrians walk. Cars coming down Main Street to make a right-hand turn onto Elm and the stoplight is not green, drive through the gas pumps rather than waiting for the, the light to change or traffic to move. The gas station owner signed this petition with the hopes that it might make changes. Why do trucks coming down Main not make their right hand turns at highway number 58 rather than Elm Street? Trucks and cars ignore the speed limit coming up Elm Street and the light is green. Routinely trucks gear up to beat the light. If red, they slam on their brakes, causing our building to shake. Very few children play at the shoe park on Elm Street. I firmly believe it's because of the increase in traffic. In closing, I want to set this, let this council know I have spoken to 20 to 30 families, some getting this petition done who share these concerns. Thank you for listening to me this evening. I hope that truck and traffic is rerouted. More visible speed limit signs are put up in place and flashing pedestrian, so uh, uh, 
flashing pedestrian lights are put at, at the Main Street intersection. Also, children at play signs be put up when needed. Thank you very much. Thank you, and I'll uh, ask Council if there's any questions. Council Bruno? Uh, thank you, thank you, Janet, for making that uh, presentation. I know during the campaign and through many of the apartment buildings along Elm, you've been active in trying to get this brought forward. And um, I don't know if it's appropriate now, but perhaps, Mr. Mayor, through you, uh, Mr. Schapowski, the Director of uh, Public Works, if we could have this. Councilor, can we, can we just do questions to the sure. Sure. speaker, then I'll, I'll come back to you. Thanks. No problem. Yeah. Uh, any further questions for our speaker? Great. Thanks, Ms. Orr. We won't make you stand there while we Thank go through you. some other stuff. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Councillor Bruno to staff. Thank you. Thank you, Worship, for the opportunity through you to Mr. Schapowski. I'm wondering if one of the ways to handle um, uh, Janet's complaint and that of the, the neighbors along there, I know Frank uh, has been involved in this too with the uh, with the issues on Elm Street. I'm wondering if we could take that petition and try and address each one of them. I know that some of them uh, may be uh, regional or provincial with Highway 3, uh, the intersection part, but I'm wondering if if you could come back sort of with a point-by-point -point, uh, issue. I just wanted to add one other thing. I, I spoke to Steve just earlier. Um, one of the other issues is a section of Elm that was left unpaved but approved a couple years ago because we believe the Humberson Builders property was going to plug in there. Um, there's a lot of ruts there that obviously Public Works identified a long time ago, hence the paving from Kalali all the way up to Charles. If we could maybe leave a smaller space there and can fix that, uh, that paving in that area, um, as well, I know I've had you, all, Mr. Mayor, looking at this too. Um, I think there's some things that we should be doing with Elm Street, not to obstruct places like West Pier and others that need delivery, but certainly there are a number of empty tractor trailers uh, and empty um, uh, uh, trailers at the back that, that slam through there. Um, and some of that could be shave and pave, but some of it could be, you know, we have Highway 58, West Side Road, Kalali Street, or Regional Road, with the one section being um, ours. And those roads were built to handle this truck traffic. And I know some of Janet's complaints was, and concerns were about speeding, but some of it certainly are about noise and tractor trailers. And so I'm wondering maybe if I could add in, uh, if Steve's addressing this in, in a few weeks, um, to also look at what could be done about getting um, truck traffic um, that isn't delivering on Elm to use 58 West Side Road and Kalali. So uh, I know that's a lot, Steve, to jam into uh, and to camp on to Janet's uh, uh, presentation. But uh, I mean, it's it's pretty evident that there's a problem there, and uh, uh, heard it a lot during the campaign and uh, saw the petitions in apartment buildings and uh, and some of the names on there from the houses along there. So uh, perhaps we could address that. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Councilor. Through you, Your Worship, to Council. So what uh, what we'll do is we'll conduct uh, a typical traffic safety uh, review. So what we'll do is we'll review the roadway, determine where the signs are. I took a number of notes from uh, the delegates' uh, presentation as well, so we can address those concerns as they go through, as long as with yours, and then we can bring a report back to Council on our findings. Um, we'll probably shoot for February, if that's okay with Council. Make sure you include the region with that, because Definitely. obviously... Main being there, yeah. so the intersection is, is shared. I believe the lighting system is the region's lighting system. Um, so, with regards to comments made about lighting, if we can include the region. If you need, um, uh, well, the regional councilor and I can work on it. I do sit on public works. Uh, councilor Davies doesn't, but uh, he can still work within uh, his parameters. A regional councilor too. The other issue, we'll take it to um, our local staff sergeant to step up some. Uh, radar um, days in that area. Um, they may bring in the traffic squad for that, I'm not sure, but uh, we could have them look at that whole, basically the, the four corner area and then back towards uh, the downtown core and then as we go north on Elm. 
Is that right? Okay, Council. So I'm gonna I'm gonna ask for a motion to to refer that to to staff for that report to come back. If I could have Councillor Bruno, Councillor Danch, move that. Yeah. Oh yeah. Go ahead. Thank you. You're okay to second it though. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> And, you know, and, and, and I, I live right where you guys do, and uh, I'm on that street probably longer than some of you. But uh, I just wonder if maybe we could extend the walk sign there, because I know I've you know, tried to hoof it over to the bakery or something like that, and maybe a little bit younger than some of them other guys, but it's a, it's a pretty quick walk. You know, and it, it's a busy intersection. There's no doubt about it. So if maybe we could look into that and add that to the, the list, I'd appreciate that as well. Thank you. So for Boston cream there, Frank? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Dave, or Councillor Elliott. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, through you to Steve. Uh, there are the portable speed signs that we had. There was a couple down by my house on Clarence Street. Um, are they still available, and can we set those up on Elm? Just with that number flashing, and I've seen it in different mm -hmm. municipalities, it's amazing how quickly people slow down when they see what the number is, and that may start to have people trying to think about what the speed actually is instead of just flying along. If they're still available, I don't know if they are. Yeah, the staff does move them around the city, so uh, Steve can certainly look at that. Um, I went by one the other day. I can't remember where it was, but I did see it. Um, so, yeah, I think it was up there, wasn't it? I was with you. Um, yeah, so uh, Steve, at your, you know, based on schedule, can you look after that too? Yeah, through your worship. What we'll do is we'll go through the traffic study first. We'll try to determine where the pitch points are and where the issues are. Uh, following with that, one of the recommendations may be to install those for a basis or collect more information. So we may determine that we need more information at that time because we'll get the traffic count, how many people are actually driving through too. So we'll, we'll take that into consideration and uh, put those up at the right time. Great. Thanks, Steve. Further questions? Seeing none, all in favor? That's carried. Thanks, Steve. And thank the presenter. Our next delegation is from uh, DeWitt Carter Public School. It's with regards to uh, doing uh, median planting for native plants within Port Colburn. Um, they've mentioned a number of streets here, but we'll let them give their presentation first. If you guys just want to state your name for the record. Can I introduce them? Yes, you can. Oh, just hit the red, sorry, hit the red button there in front of you. Sorry. There you go. Go ahead. Want me to start again? Sure. <laughs> just let people at home know who it is. I'm Stephanie Miner. Uh, I'm a teacher, a grade 7, 8 teacher at DeWitt Carter. And I'm very proud that Sabian Bloomfield Cook and Jersey Warner are representing our class in this delegation. Um, but also I'd like to recognize that have um, Logan Marges and Josh Lowry here to support uh, their peers in this presentation. Do we have the presentation up? We'd like to say that this, this comes from the students. I'm only here as a chaperone. <laughs> Could you advance it to the next slide, please? So we're here to ask you to change. And we know that change is really difficult. Human beings aren't really hardwired for change. We like to do things the way they've always been because it's easy and it requires less work. Uh, but we also know that if we don't change, uh, that 20% of the wild species in Canada are going to be extinct over the next few years. And we also know that the impact of climate change is likely to be irreversible. So why are we here? We are here to convince you to allow us to turn grass medians into native gardens. In September, we participated in a field trip where we looked at over 14 houses with native gardens and how the animals and insects interacted with the native gardens more than they did with the grass. In addition, we also paced out 1,800 square meters of dry grassy medians. 
So where did lawns come from? In the 1700s, lawns were a sign of wealth. They were also a way to use chemicals and tools repurposed from the war. Do they really make sense in 2022? In 2022, we have worldwide water shortages and shortages of nutritious local produce. Pollinators like bees are decreasing. Why is grass bad? Grass is a non-native ecological dead space. It does not provide food or habitat. It requires 11.5 lillian, trillion liters of water, 27 million kilograms of pesticides, and 11 billion gal liters of gasoline to maintain. What's the alternative to grass? Native plants. Native plants focus on the ecological purpose of plants, which is to provide food and habitat. They also have a deep root structure that stores water and has good drainage. Going back to what Stephanie said, having less grass and more native plants is the single most important thing we can do to limit the impact of climate change. We research some plants that are native to Ontario, and here are some of the beautiful ones we'd like to plant, as you can see on the TV. How can we all be leaders for change? You can allow us to change some grass medians into native gardens. What's in it for you? Port Colborne would be known as one of the cities helping against climate change and protecting precious water resources. What do we need from you? We need approval to replant some grass medians, preferably on West Street, Steel Street, or Elm Street. We also need funds to purchase equipment. So our timeline, uh, we're hoping that uh, by March of next year we will have um, equipment and supplies that we'll be able to remove the grass in April, that we'll do the planting in May, and in June we'll carry on with uh, maintenance to make sure everything's going well. Who will do all the work? We will do all the work and maintenance. In case you are worried about maintenance, using mulch and densely planting will reduce weeds. Do we have Ready your support? <laughs> Great guys, thank you. It's very good. <laughs> So being the winter time, which is a good thing right now for this, is that we have time to, to um, put our staff together with you guys to look at areas um, that this can uh, be done in. I know um, Dave Sabo, who's in, does most of our gardens, or all of our gardens, and leads specifically our summer students um, for the maintenance of that, has done some of this work in some of our parks around the city uh, where it's uh, more naturalized plantings. So if I could, uh, before I go to questions, if we can ask council, and um, I'll have councillors Hoyle and Beauregard move that we refer this to staff um, to discuss this with the, the school and uh, come back with a, or it, quite frankly, I don't think we even need them to come back, do we? We can have the staff move forward and work with the school with this? Right. Um, I do suggest too, is there is our community granting so I know you're looking for funds is to put an application in. Um, I've got your contact information. I'll get uh, Gail Todd to send you the application so you can look at it and you can submit that into our That'd committee and then uh, they can look at uh, the merits of it, which I think would be pretty good, but I, I can't say for the whole committee, but uh, at least put that in and uh, it could help uh, jumpstart uh, this program. So questions from council? Councillor Bruno, and then Councillor Baggy. Thank you. Thanks for the excellent presentation. Halfway through your presentation, I thought of, and I know there are issues about city boulevards. I know there's issues about sight lines. Mm -hmm. But I got to thinking that this is, um, this could get modeled after, like, adopt a road. So could somebody adopt a boulevard and be the principal caretaker out of it and maybe that those funds are in front of their house but they come from their money or their neighbors and this could morph into maybe something more than just um, the areas that you designed so see if we could make this kind of go viral and I don't know if in your research and that anybody else is doing this in Niagara or did you did you model this after uh, something you read or another city? This came as an initiative from the students after oh, we fantastic. did our field trip. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and I think what we're thinking is that it would be an ongoing thing. I'm a grade seven, eight teacher, so Sabian's in grade eight, a seven, Jersey's in grade eight, so as we move along, the, the grade eights would bring the grade sevens along, so this could be an ongoing project for Dewitt Carter. Great, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good, thank you, Councilor. Councilor Baggett. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, uh, I had this is your class on Charlotte Street. I never Charlotte. I saw a bunch of people looking at somebody's yard, and I think, wow, they must be studying the, the garden, which it was it was your school, and I, I commend you for it. Uh, you know, it wasn't too long ago before I got on council, reading the paper, a resident was having a fight with City Hall because he put he planted natural grasses on his whole front yard. And the city bylaw officials said it was against the bylaws, and there was a big squabble through the newspaper whether he was right or wrong. It was some people call it weeds, some people want to see the grass, and uh, it's amazing how far we have come. You know that this is what we actually really want, mm -hmm. and uh, I would love to see it expanded with uh, your school, the other schools, and uh, I think it'd be great. So. I have some great leaders in my class. I'm sure we could take that on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and actually, I hear you're a great teacher. I'm a member of the library board who's also a teacher at your school, and she talks very, very highly of you, how you're getting the kids uh, really excited about you know, climate change and stuff and how they can fix things. And uh, I commend you very much for it. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Borgard. Through your worship to the presenters, uh, Thank you for your presentation. I'm just curious as to uh, the reasoning for the location of these, uh, the particular streets that the request is for. D. Carter's on the east side. I'm curious as to why no on, locations on the east side were. On to. West Street, there was like a long stretch of grass, a grass, there's a long stretch of a grassy median. And I, we just, I think that we could change that to maybe a native garden because the native garden would help more there because it's by the water. Okay. And what about the other two? <laughs> the other two were just like, I don't know, but really. <laughs> we, okay. They were higher visibility and higher traffic areas that we thought it would be nice to have the work showcased where more people could see it and where more people would enjoy it because those streets are like roadways and like sit in like neighborhoods so if we put it there it, it would somebody would notice it and okay. look nice. thank you good thank you counselor so if it's anything like the mayor's christmas card submissions our, our paint a snow plow submission which duet carter won the first year we did that um with the challenge that uh, counselor bag you mentioned this could morph into something pretty good. Um, hope so. The schools are really getting involved more and more in what's going on within the city, which is a great thing. So, and I think working with our staff and, and especially at this time, Dave Zabo, um, you know, we, we've been able to actually garner some free product from um, different organizations across Ontario, especially with regards to the Carolinian forest that we have here in Port Colborne. And we've planted a number of trees uh, at Cedar Bay Park uh, with regards to the to those um, because that's a Carolinian area. So he has a good handle on who out there may have some great uh, product that can go into the ground for us. So I think um, with you guys working with our staff and and uh, May Lannon and our, our environmental uh, coordinator, um, we can come up with some great ideas and great things. I mean, actually I was talking about this today with Gail and I was thinking at the end of Western Sugarloaf, where the new um, small cruise dock is, it's more of a weedy area. That may be a great start on West Street of that area where there's not a lot of foot traffic within that median area, and it really can take a good foothold and, and really show the world because the world does come to Port Coburn on cruise ships um, what we're all about, and that could be a good start. But uh, I look forward to with staff while working with you guys over the uh, early part of the winter and put a good plan in together for the spring. Great, thank you. And just so I can, we can report back to my class tomorrow morning. Um, so the next step is that you're going to forward the grant well, application? Well, yeah, so I'll get Gail to send you the grant application. I'll have uh, staff contact you to coordinate through um, our parks and roads uh, people, because they're, they're all intertwined through Steve's department. Um, and then they can get uh, going on some ideas and, 
and what's best. So, and then this time of year, I know Dave plants a lot of things within the greenhouse, but you know he's not tending a lot of gardens, so maybe he's got a little bit more time in his hands <laughs> that he can uh, go forward with this project. So, Councilor Bruno, uh, just to the grant application, the first intake for the year ends uh, January thirtieth. So I think that's the date. Yes. Yeah. So. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. You don't have a lot of time, but it's pretty self-explanatory. And you can even view it online, too, under grants. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah I'll get Gail to get a hold of you to make sure everything is, is sent. Further questions, Council? So it's a motion to refer to staff. All those in favor? That's carried. Great. Thank you Thanks, so guys. for having us. Thank you. Appreciate it. So next up is uh, staff remarks. Uh, any staff online that uh, have anything for council? Nobody's popping up. Staff in house tonight. Anything for council? No. Okay. Just do it. Oh, sorry. Sure. Through your worship to council, and mostly just to get this out over the air. I know our um, Metro Land reporter Nick is here today, and folks watching on YouTube. There is the planned city hall closure from. <coughs> The end of business on Friday the 23rd, returning to the office on Tuesday the 3rd of January. We are tipping that out through all of our media channels, so this isn't the only announcement. Um, library and museum do have some hours in there. Recreation facilities do have some hours in there, um, such as the Valley Health and Wellness Center. And <clears throat> last but not least, and we are making sure that we communicate this uh, very well externally, the elevator at City Hall is going to be out of service for planned maintenance from Thursday, December 15th, two days from now, until we think the 20th of January, but we're hoping it's a little bit shorter. And uh, as uh, we're going to make alternate arrangements for anybody who needs to access the second or third floor to do business with the city. And we thought the best time to do that was when there already is a week of closures so that there's minimized disruption to the public. Great, thank you. Uh, next is uh, Councillor Remarks. I'll start on my left, Councillor Bodner. Nothing except to wish everybody a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Uh, be safe over the holidays and remember the reason for the season. Thanks. Thanks, Councillor. Councillor Dash. Yeah, I got to join him on that one. It's always great to shut her down for a few days and uh, do the family and friend things and, uh, you know, just wish everybody the best, whether it's council or, you know, you people out there in the workforce. And hopefully you all have a good one. Take care. Thanks. Councilor Baggio. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'll plagiarize the two councilors, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Councilor. Councilor Bruno. Uh, thank you, Worship. Uh, uh, ditto uh, to my former fellow colleagues um, on, on Christmas and a, and a happy holiday season and New Year. I did have one um, item, it's a thank you um, to the chief uh, and his um, bylaw staff and to the uh, firefighters. A uh, couple things, uh, had some issues which they quickly responded to uh, boarding up and sidewalk, sidewalk issue on uh, George Street in front of the old Lutheran church there. But one of the ones that was brought forward to me by one of the residents of uh, 119 Neff Street apartment building, there was, uh, on November 19th, uh, was the morning of the storm, and an elderly lady there uh, went out to shovel out her car before the um, plow came through, and she fell and hurt her shoulder, and this was like 7.30 a.m. Uh, lots of ambulance calls. Um, Fire department got called. They were there first. The ambulance was on a 35, 40 minute delay. And uh, Chief, your guys came, um, kept her calm. Uh, she wishes to thank you. She did break her shoulder. Um, she's on the mend, but uh, she wanted to um, express her thank you. And I wanted to too, having been there and uh, was able to get hold of uh, someone really quick there. And they were there within a few minutes. and. Kept her warm, kept her stable until the ambulance arrived about 20 minutes later. So kudos to you and your staff, and please pass that on. And Merry Christmas. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Elliott. I'll just add my best wishes for a Christmas, uh, happy Christmas season to everybody. Um, and again, kudos to staff and all of the people that entered into the uh, Christmas parade. Um, I watched it from the corner of uh, 
stealing uh, clearance and we had family that came down and joined us. They could not believe how many entries there were and how good it was. And they had a nighttime parade in their town. They're from Kingsville. Um, they said our parade completely outshone what they have. They, uh, they were so happy that they had the opportunity to come. So kudos to everybody that did that. Kicks off the Christmas season. And um, I just hope that everybody has a, a great holiday. Uh, be safe and enjoy your time with your family. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Aquilina. Uh, thank you. I'd like to uh, wish all the residents of Port Colborne uh, happy holidays and to uh, City Hall staff uh, the same. Thank you. Councillor Borgard. <laughs> your Worship, uh, I'd just like to give kudos to uh, public works staff, uh, Mr. Shapowski, Director Shapowski and his, his team for the work they've done on Wellington Avenue in terms of Wellington Street, sorry, in regards to the um, speeding, the, the, in addressing speeding and putting uh, traffic calming measures in place. And I look forward to the report uh, of the statistics that are going to come from that. So, And then, like my fellow councillors, I would like to say Happy Holidays, Merry Christmas to uh, all staff and as well as the residents of Bookover. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Hoyle. Yeah, I'd like to say uh, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year to everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank staff for uh, uh, dealing with all the multiple questions I've thrown at them in the last uh, couple weeks as a newbie. Um, but everyone have a safe holidays and see you in the new year. Great. Thank you, Councillor. On to staff reports. First item is uh, 9.1, Port Colborne Municipal Drain. Second meeting uh, to consider. It's uh, report 2022-250. We do have a motion, which I'll bring uh, after. We do have Paul Marsh. Uh, uh, he's an, uh, our engineer from EWA, Inc., and he'll be providing a presentation. And then we have a couple delegations after delegate. that. So. Uh, here's Alana. Alana wants to come forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Council. Um, this meeting, the meeting to consider through the Drainage Act, gives Council the option to accept or reject this report. Uh, staff Report 2022-250 recommends uh, the acceptance of the report. At this meeting, council may reject if they feel the report is incomplete. If the report is accepted, uh, this report will move to the Court of Revision, uh, the next step of the Drainage Act. And uh, furthermore, if accepted, council would need to appoint uh, three councillors to sit at the Court of Revision with an alternate in case one of those should not be available. Uh, as mentioned, this is the second sitting um, of the or sorry, the second time that this report has been to Council. Uh, we were first here in July 26, 21, um, where there were a number of items that were unclear between uh, the City and the Engineer, um, as long as some other items that were um, looked at a little bit differently than what they actually were. Um, these items were addressed at the July 26 meeting, uh, the concerns that were brought forward at that time. And um, those have been addressed now, and Mr. Marsh will uh, speak to, to those. Um, so just a reminder, again, this is only for um, either rejecting or accepting the report. Um, there is no consideration of any um, fees at this point. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll hand it over to Mr. Marsh for his presentation. Thank you. Welcome, Mr. Marsh. Thanks, Alana. Um, Mayor Steele, members of council, landowners within the Port Coburn watershed, and my sympathies to anyone who comes after us in the agenda that has to get through this presentation. <laughs> but if you can advance to the next one. Um, what I've done uh, is the exact same presentation again. Any slides that are different, you will notice a green dot in the top right corner of the slide. But with your permission, recognizing that some have already seen it before and some have not, 
I'll go through the whole thing again, but very, very briefly on those slides that are unchanged. Um, so that just the, the agenda there is fine. So there were five things that we were directed to revise in the report. Uh, those actions, number one was there was a discrepancy between one of the assessment maps and one of the CAD maps. And there was an out-of-date roll number on one of the properties. The CAD map was updated so that it's the same as the assessment maps. Since this was done almost a year ago, undoubtedly there are still further changes, but for the purposes, purposes of the report, the assessments are all as they are presented. The second one is the Port Colburn branch number one. We were asked to review the catchment boundaries given that they were originally drawn based on 2012 <coughs> orthophoto information. We conduct, actually the city of Port Colburn staff conducted a, a survey. I walked the individual property myself and we made a revision in the boundary. It narrowed to the east with less, fewer properties within the Port Colburn branch number one. If you can advance. Number three, Mr. Mr. Halinga provided a copy of report to council in 2013-1. and It was in draft form, it was unsigned. So we were unsure as whether it's official documentation or not, but it basically reported that the quarry is covering all of the costs of extending the drain from its current location north to the second concession and we were directed to recognize that and all costs associated with that extension have been assigned to the quarry. There was some balancing of those costs in the previous report. Now 100% of those costs are recorded against the quarry. Thank you. Next one. Um, number four, Mr. Halinga, Mrs. Conk, Mr. Wells ask questions regarding the C factor as a weighted adjustment. The C factor is used in order to represent how much runoff from an individual property is generated and it's used in the calculation of the individual assessment. It's not used in any part of the design of the drain. It's used as a measure to share costs amongst the landowners equally. In this, farms are typically given a 35 C factor value. And originally, part of the quarry was recognized as being like a farm and was assessed at 35. As part of our discussions, it's recognized that the quarry bottom is in fact all stone and nothing like a farm. And so we have taken the average of those two values, a 60 C factor, and assigned it to the quarry lands. There was one property where we didn't do this at the time that it was done because it was still largely agricultural and less quarry. In the intervening time, that's no longer true. It's now more quarry and less agricultural. We will bring forward part of a revision request in the court of revision to change that to a 60 value and the same as all the other ones. You can advance, please. Number five. Um, we had additional cost reports that were discovered and presented regarding the granting that went on for the works conducted in 2016. Um, these works predate Alana and I, and we have only the reports that we've been able to find showing the accounting of what was done where and what grants were applied to what parts. We have done our absolute best to sort out what money should go where, it reduced some of the costs of the works that were done in 2016. It eliminated the cost for the fordings on the property of Conk and Van Reuven. Um, and we recognized all of the grant money that we, we could understand and contribute towards the drain. So there's an update in the report that reduced that cost. I'll explain that a little bit later. Keep going, please. So this is a previous slide. Previously, this was referred to as W1, W2, and it was W2 A and B, all of which since that time have been consumed by the quarry. The quarry occupies the lands previously under which these drainage section, these drainage pieces existed. They were addressed in a 73 Clark report 
and if you advance, please. They, the, the one to the left of you one uh, went all the way to the second concession. We know that because there's a culvert still existing on the second concession that passes water from the north to the south. The other one on the W2 A and B goes to the, to the east and serves lands that are now completely consumed by the quarry. Go ahead. Um, this is just another map produced by the, the city showing those. Go ahead. This is the 1999 report where W1 and W2 was realigned. W1 was abandoned. It wasn't abandoned all the way to the second concession, which I think was an omission of the time. It was only abandoned halfway. So in theory, the rest of the drain may still exist that way, but it's really not material. We accept it as being wholly abandoned. All the way down to the north side of the culvert that is the MTO culvert that crosses Highway 3. Please advance. This is what the realignment that was done in that same report. It introduced a wiggle in the drain so that the quarry could abut right up against their property. Go ahead, please. This is a 23 report that was brought that abandoned W2B and changed the boundary for lands that flowed west and lands that flowed east. And it was to allow the quarry to continue to quarry those lands. Um, you can see that to the right, there is the Michener drain shown. This will be the subject of a future report that I'm currently working on that deals with those lands that are now expected to be consumed by the expansion of the quarry. Uh, next one, please. Um, this is about the 2016 work. This, it's around the Conk and Van Ruven property. Uh, Alana straightened the drain, did a shortcut, uh, as it were, and uh, Go ahead. This is what it looks like. This is where the two fordings are recognized. So this, this is what we've done. We started in 2018 with a baseline report that basically said, here are the problems that exist in the drain that we need to deal with. There's a watershed analysis that, conducts, that uses a computer model to do hydrology and hydraulic calculations. There's the original report prepared in April 16th, 2021, presented here in July of 2021, uh, remotely. I wasn't physically present for that one. And we're here, the report was updated April 28th, 2022, and being presented today. Um, this is a look at, at the work that's proposed and has already happened. There's a petition request from um, the city as the road authority for Schneider to be connected to what used to be called W1. It allows road the, the road runoff on Schneider to cut across the north and be serviced by the MTO culvert. Um, the second part is, whoop, if you could go back please, uh, the extension of the drain on the east side of Babion Road fully to the second concession and allowing the water that's coming from the north to make a full connection with the drain. Um, this really should have been done a long time ago. It's long overdue to happen. It's the main section 78 aspect of the report. Um, you can see in 2016, there's a piece that's already been realigned. There's a piece in the middle that's at the back of Mrs. Conk's house, the red dotted line. I keep pointing at the screen, I'm sorry. <laughs> the red dotted line that is to be abandoned behind her house. It no longer exists as a drain or a channel. There's some possibility it would flood in the future if there's a rainstorm that would exceed the capacity of the drain, but that's true for all other parts of the drain as well. Um, so the, this part north of Highway 3 is being reestablished since it was abandoned to the north side of Highway 3 in 1999. And the only other part is the stuff to the east that's now wholly consumed by the, the uh, quarry W2 and W2A and W2B. Go ahead. We did revise some of the watershed at the very north end based on information we collected and also reviewing the uh, contour lines from the 20, 2012 data collected by the region. Go ahead. 
um, this is from the report. It details the proposed work in a little bit more um, detail. Uh, go ahead, please. Um, two things in this. One, uh, we have to readjust the culverts at the intersection of Babian Road and the second concession to ensure that the water flows to the east side of Babian in order to proceed down. There's a brand new culvert constructed by the quarry on Babian on the east side, but there's an older PVC culvert that you can see there just north of it. It's too high. It's what we call perched. It's, it's blocking the water from getting where it's supposed to do, go to. It has to be removed. The existing uh, corrugated steel pipe that's there, we've used it within our grade calculations and we've extended the grade in order so it matches up with the proposed culvert reworks at the intersection. This is not a very complicated piece of work. Go ahead. Um, we used a computer. We, there's a design storm. It's 97 millimeters in 24 hours. If you get more rain than that, yes, the drain will be exceeded. It's statistically within the realm of a one in five year design storm agricultural and the drainage act typically looks at one and two year the urban is a one in five year expectation we've extrapolated that to the to the rural area as well recognizing that many in these watersheds they're almost as urban as they are rural anymore and so we're using a higher standard this drain meets that standard based on the computer analysis there was an actual storm that delivered 104 millimeters in 16 hours. Uh, Mr. Van Ruven shared his, his uh, gauge results that corroborated this. These results are actually from the sewage treatment plant a gauge that's in Port Colburn here. It, record, it records the rain on a five minute interval, which the one out on the pier does not. It's on a daily record. Um, there's statistically the storm lines up between a one in 25 and one in 50 year storm go ahead um, this is what the computer model looks like I have to say that the grade eights presentation was a lot more interesting looking than mine I keep going um, we do, along with the computer model, do a hydraulic calculation of the drain just to verify that it, it, it's correct. Go ahead. And keep going. So this is where things changed based on the direction, the fifth direction that was provided by council, which was the costs. Uh, can you advance to the next one? This is the old reporting of the cost in advance, please. And this is the new in this report. And so one of the changes is the 47,244.69. That's actually a decrease. However, because of the extra engineering effort that was involved, that cost went up by an almost similar amount. So it's almost a zero sum game in making the changes. Go ahead, please. This is that same comparison in more detail. Um, yeah. um, this, these are some of the assessments principles. Um, one of them is, is that when we've done these reports, we've used $10,000 per acre. And um, we use that as the recognition of the agricultural value of land and we apply it everywhere, regardless of what, um, What's the provincial agency that does the, the land? MPAC, regardless of what MPAC says. We use an agricultural value everywhere. However, in the last two years, I'm not sure that 10,000 an acre is exactly representative anymore. Where our family farm is, farms are now selling for 16,000 uh, 16, an acre and north of that in some cases. And so then in the future, we may have to look at whether that's still representative. In the past, I've looked at real estate reports that corroborates for Niagara at the time of this report, 10,000 an acre was a comparable value. Go ahead, please. Um, when we calculate allowances, uh, allowances are money moving from one neighbor to another neighbor in support of the way the act works. If you take land, the person gets paid for that land. 
all of the money comes from the rest of the neighbors. It doesn't come from the city or anywhere else. So it's important to recognize allowances are, are money passing between neighbors for a valid reason. More allowances, I don't believe, is anybody's best interest. So we don't pay for trees, we replace trees. Two for one. Two saplings for every tree that gets taken that's within um, the working easement. If it's in the drain, it's always been a problem tree. But if it's in the working easement, easement that landowner receives a sap, two saplings in replacement of that tree. Advance, please. The other one is Section 23, Outlet Liability, Outlet Benefit. Outlet, li outlet liability refers to the fact that everybody has to pay for the water that runs off their property. Outlet benefit, individuals gain a benefit from the drain servicing their property. So if as a farmer we have a tile and the drain is serving that tile, we get an outlet benefit as well as we have an outlet liability. Advance, please. That calculation is really based on the peak capacity of a drain. So everybody's water runs off and takes up a certain part of the drain that fits within the capacity of the drain. So we try to balance that, we recognize that. It's the way the act is set up. If you need a bigger drain, somebody has to pay for it. With regards to the way the quarry works, they don't have water run off from their property unless it goes through a pump. So they don't actually occupy the peak flow at the time that everybody else's peak flow is occurring. Go ahead, advance. In this though, we are still assessing them a C factor of 60, which is higher than anyone else except the industrial properties that are down in the bottom quarter, just south of the uh, bicycle path. Go ahead. And that's the changes that are shown there. Um, the, one the one individual property there, the lighter blue one, in the just north of Highway 3, that's the one that in hindsight, I, I wish I had made that 60. We've had a discussion with OMAFRA about this practice because it influences the next drain over the Wignall, <coughs> where they're proposing to expand the quarry and when do I decide how to assess that work? And um, not to spoil that presentation, but uh, we're expecting to keep it 60 in recognition the drain is adding value to those lands, even though they could stay agricultural for 20, 25 years. So there's a basis for recognizing that. I've had the discussion with OMAFRA, and I'll be happy to explain it to you at a future date. Go ahead. This is just some of the C factor, and the C factor compares property to property. So if you reduced one property by five bucks, everybody else's has to go up to recover that five bucks. Because we raise the amount of money we need in our budget from everybody in the watershed. Somebody gets reduced, everybody else pays a little more. So when you're fooling around with C factors, you have to recognize you're chasing five bucks with engineers' time. And it, it's not worth that much, to be honest. Uh, it's, it's better just to recognize fairness with the assessment, present that, go forward with it, support the report, uh, get the works done that need to be done. Uh, go ahead. Um, this is a, a chart where we compared the pumping rate from the quarry to see that it wasn't exceeding their peak value. Next uh, slide, please. And it's not. Uh, based on our calculations, it's well under the value. So even when they do pump, they're not occupying the same space that they would have if, we, if they were running and directly connected to the drain. Go ahead. So the summary of the changes that were asked of us, there were five of them. We updated the CAD property. Number two, there were minor adjustments in Port Colburn branch number one catchment. The costs for the extension of the Port Col Colburn drain were completely assigned to the quarry with one small modification in there. The culverts that are underneath the intersection of Babian Road and Carl Road that have to be rejigged, half of that is shared with the city whose road and culverts it is serving, and the other half is paid for by the quarry. Uh, in the past, some portion of that was shared by the watershed to the north. That's no longer the case. All monies are either coming from the city or from the quarry on a 50-50 basis. 
Um, number four, all, all quarry values will have a value, a C factor of 60, and that will influence their ratio of the, of the charges. Um, these are the, some of the tables that Atlanta and I were reviewing, and it's showing that uh, the fordings are, are assessed a, a value of zero now. They were $750. Uh, and we, we believe a grant covered that cost. Go ahead. That's the sum total of my presentation. Thank you very much for your kind attention tonight. Thank you, Mr. Marsh. Council, questions with regards to the report from the consultant? Councilor Baggy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Mr. Marsh, good to see you again. I think I heard you correct twice, but just for clarifications, because it's been a while yes. since we talked about it. If there's a change of assessment on somebody's property, you said the neighbors pay the extra fees. Is it the people downstream, or is it all people, upstream and downstream, that pay for that? Yes, it can be both. It so, can be both. Yes, so with an allowance, that can go into a pool that's get allocated to the entire watershed. And so, depending on what the allowance is for, so in the case of the branch number one, where we're extending from Highway 1 over to Snyder Road, and we're paying for an allowance to extend that drain through that area. Not the original part, because we're presuming that was paid for once before, when it existed before the quarry did, but the last bit that gets to Snyder, we're paying a small allowance for that that only stays within those landowners that are part of that branch number one catchment. It doesn't go to the wider area. Okay. Councilor? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Great, thank you. Further questions? Councilor Bottom. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you to the presenter. Um, on these drains, as anybody involved would know, we had uh, a number of engineers work on this besides yourself and um, would it be safe to say that at the quarter revision that we could deal with any adjustments to the costs of either both Weeb or AMEC or either one of those at the quarter revision if we so choose who's ever on that quarter revision Mark? Through, through you, Mr. Mayor and Councilor, you are correct. The Court of Revision can make those adjustments. And in fact, uh, the Michener report, um, this was done. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> Stay tuned. I think it might be done again, too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Councilor. Uh, You're all set? Yes. I may have more questions after we hear the presentations yep. of, of Mr. Marshall. Thanks. Good. Thank you. Seeing no further questions, so we do have two delegations at this time, um, but don't go anywhere. Thank you. So our first delegation is from Jack Halinga. Jack, do you want to come up? Welcome, Jack. Thank you. Uh, I guess this is on. Before we get into what I prepared as a presentation, I just had a couple questions. Um, Mr. Marsh has stepped out, so, uh, but uh, had I had the information that was in the previous presentation, it would have changed a little bit of how I have prepared my presentation because some of the uh, slides are almost identical to my slides. So there will be duplication, but maybe that will just clarify some of the same um, items. For those who don't know me, I'm Jack Hellinga, and my wife and I reside at 770 Highway 3, and we are our properties are tributary to the W1 branch drain and to the Wignall drain. And my reference to Wignall drain is what I still consider, and I 
believe almost every resident in that area still considers the Wignall drain. Uh, I'll get into that in my presentation. Uh, but for Mr. Marsh, uh, on page six of the report, figure two is the OMAF ag maps. And uh, the description below says what is clearly shown in figure two are the two, actually three top branches of the drain. So everything that divides south of Highway 3, there's a branch to the east that went to Babian Road, crossed Babian Road as w Wignall uh, W2, and then branched again to 2A and 2B as one branch. And then W1 went to the west and uh, I guess before 1999, before it was truncated by Port Coburn Quarries, uh, it went all the way to second concession to the culvert that you showed on, on your plan. And uh, so that, I, I guess I'm just wanting to clarify that there are actually the two branches. Uh, in this report, the east branch is called the main drain, which changes how the drainage areas to each are assessed. W1 flows from the west, and it has its own assessment. But W2, which goes to the east, is shared by W1 as well as the rest of the watershed. So if there are two branches and the hydraulics, your hydraulic calculations show two uh, watersheds, why is there not a separate assessment table for those that contribute only to W2? Because as a contributor to W1, I'm paying for W2, but for example, Mr. Henderson on W2 does not pay for any of the costs to W1. So there is a lack in distribution of costs once that main drain divides. The, um, going back to 1979, when R.V. Anderson wrote their report, the stationing for W1 was conti continuous from the main drain and W2 started at the intersection and started at zero again separately. So back in 79, they recognized the west as the main drain, even though the, the work was shared, there was no separate assessment for W1 or W2 or the main drain, everything was lumped together. But back then, the west was the main drain and now it's considered the, the east as the main drain. So I think that that creates an issue in that the properties that are draining to a branch are not being assigned the cost of that branch. Uh, the Drainage Act, as I understand it, says that users shall pay for the drain, the portions of the drain that they use. And since W1 doesn't use the W2 branch, they should not be assigned the costs for it. This is going to show up in my uh, slides as well, but the, um, this will have implications in the future as well. You, could, you heard me continue to call these W1, W2 Wignall drain, and um, if we could start with the history. The Wignall drain started in Humberston Township even before 1884, but was recognized by a Township of Humberston drain report in 1884. Next slide. Right across the plan, it's this Township of Humberston, and it shows two drains. They end at the CNR track because the CNR had Gone, uh, gone through by that time, and there were two separate crossings. The blue one, if you can recognize that. Next slide. 
Okay. <coughs> um, the blue one is the Michener, and the red one is the Wignall. The Wignall commenced at the upper end at the CNR tracks. That property was owned by a Mr. Wignall, and the Michener also started at the track in that was in 1884. By 1892, the East Branch was extended and continued all the way to uh, the wetlands at uh, Carl Road almost to uh, Second Concession. Next slide. Next slide. So there were details of, of that. By 1927, both of those drains were extended all the way to second concession, both the Michener and the Wignall. The Wignall was split just south of Highway 3, east drain W2, west drain W1, and um, the, in a subsequent map, the east branches also uh, took what flow from second concession. Next, next slide. Next slide. On this one, you will see that the Michener no longer uses the crossing to the, to the east, but it is connected to the Wignall. The reasoning for that is that the Wignall crossing of the CN was much larger by the extension of the, of the Michener all the way to Carl Road they need and second concession they needed the capacity and it wasn't being provided in the east culvert next slide there's a little drain well back please a little drain south of the track where the um, wignall first ended and that shows up here and on one of the very early maps that little branch was named the Port Colburn Ditch. The, and here in 1934, it shows up. In fact, that branch is shown in one of the maps, the current maps for the 2022 report. Why is it the Port Colburn Ditch? Well, we know that the W, the Wignall and Michener were in Humberson Township. Why would Humberston Township call them the Port Colburn drain when they are the Humberstone drain? This is a Port Colburn drain because the Port Colburn ditch, because it goes from Humberstone into Port Colburn to Reuter Road. Next. And here, this map is from the engineer's report in Appendix B and at the bottom right there is the Port Coburn ditch that goes to Route Ruder Road. N next slide. This was also already shown by Mr. Marsh that by 1978, the West Branch was cut off by the quarrying in uh, Pit 2. Next slide. And, uh, and a blow up of it. And responsibility for abandonment. Mr. Marsh already referred to this report, 2013-1. Next. And next. This slide as you, or is just again, just taken directly from that report. And you'll see the references. This, this was written in 2013 and the name references are Wignall, W2, W2A, Michener's M2 drain. Next. Next. And I guess we already covered that because uh, the, uh, Mr. Marsh uh, said this as well. And um, Second concession was tributary to the drain. Uh, second concession at Babian Road, the roadside ditches were connected to it uh, or to low spots in the field. Uh, and subsequent drainage, uh, the uh, 
ditches on second concession at Carl Road actually connected to the drain that went south on Carl Road and, um, and across. And, um, <clears throat> okay, the uh, crossing of second concession at west, on the west side, this pro the current proposal suggests that the culvert under concession, second concession, be taken on the east side of Babian Road and another culvert relayed on, on the north side of second concession across Babian Road. I would suggest that it should be changed if the grades of the existing culvert on second concession are adequate and they, from the photographs I distributed. One minute to wrap up, Jack, please. Okay, um, I believe that uh, the clerk has a has correspondence from Betty Conk that uh, suggests that I could speak on her behalf, so I would like to, her time as well, please. Madam Clerk. She is unable to attend, and uh, last week she contacted the clerk for, for that. Through you, Your Worship, I understood that this presentation was on behalf of Ms. Betty Conk, um, so we will have to limit the presentation. Well, I'm trying to save the money, here, the city some money right here, because if the culvert, if the, if the water flow has to come from the northwest corner of Second Concession and Babian Road, then a culvert from the east side of Babian Road to the west side of Babian Road, south of Second Concession, would eliminate the need for installation of a culvert crossing Second Concession. And we understand that the work required to uh, move the drain to um, the east side of the right-of-way is be because of the dangers associated with the deep roadside ditch where it is at, at present. Next. When you get to assessments for what is branches and main drains, this affects W1 and W2 here, but when the report for the Michener drain comes out, which Mr. Marsh is working on, the intent here is to rename Michener M2 as the Wignall drain, making it the main drain. That means that this new Port Coburn drain is tributary to the Wignall drain, the new named Wignall drain, and therefore they share in the costs associated with maintenance of Michener M2, because, simply because of naming. Next. Okay, wrap it up, Jack, please. Okay, well, there's just a little bit more that, uh, related information as, as to what the NPCA considers the drainage to be, the drains to be <coughs> as uh, class F and class B drains. And um, they're, uh, they have in this document, which took three years to prepare, uh, a very sound watershed improvement area. Next. And there's the plan from there next. And the, uh, we've already gone through this. It's just, again, uh, C factors. And I'm using my, my property as an example. Uh, the back half moves to the uh, uh, 30. The front half and the west half doesn't flow there. And it, combined with the other, has a uh, contribution of, of C factor of 25 and it just seems like it's inconsistent for one area to have a 30 and then the, the entire area to be 25 possibly because the other is flatter and, and it may be an average of 20 and 30. Next. 
So I'm going to go, Jack, I'm going to go to questions from council now, please. Thank you. Uh, councilors, questions at this time? <laughs> Councilor uh, Bruno. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hellinger, for the presentation. I, help me out to try and understand something. Uh, I, I've heard before and tonight about the name issue. And I, I don't quite understand if drains are assessed based on what they produce to the to the drain, the watershed. Is is where where is the name in all this um, important? You know, I guess I see as an urban guy, right? If we change the name of a street, right, all other things are equal. So I'm just trying to understand um, the the meaning behind that. Well. In this case, the Wignall had a main trunk and then it branched. And under this report, it is being proposed to rename it the Port Coburn Drain and the East Branch as the Port Coburn Main Drain as an extension of the trunk. So the branch, the Port Coburn Branch 1 West Branch shares in the cost of the main branch that is east of it, but the east branch doesn't contribute because it is called the main drain. So naming it the Port Coburn main drain, which flows past the connection point, it changes who is responsible for the costs. I guess I just sort of thought I guess I just would have thought that the size of the drain and what goes into the drain are the determinants, not what you call it. Well, that's... <laughs> you'll have to ask them why they named the connection point to the east as the main drain and the other the branch drain because that is where the conflict comes in. However, when you change the Michener M2 to the name of a drain that already exists, being the Wignall, the proposal is to, to name that the Wignall drain. That is the main drain. And a continuation of the drain from the lake under the tracks and to the extreme west, to Humberson Speedway. And that is proposed to be the Wignall drain which makes the Port Coburn drain a tributary of the Wignall drain. So now it's a tributary. Now it contributes to the cost of the Wignall drain, which is not a branch. It is called the Wignall drain. So it is not, I don't know, I have not seen the Michener report. So I have not seen the new Wignall report to know how the costs north of that connection point between Port Coburn Drain and Wignall Drain are, which properties are assigned that cost. But I know for a fact this report suggests my property in, in the West Branch contributes to the cost of work done upstream of the connection point to the main drain. But properties up there on that portion and Port Coburn quarries pump to that drain that portion they don't share in my cost towards the w1 drain so that is that's part that is what the naming does so do, does the court of revision then not deal with um your contention and the change in your i don't know if the name change is okay is under the purview okay. of the court of revision thank you great thank you counselor further questions I think Jack alluded to that we're going to have to ask Mr. Marsh about the name change and how it actually does affect. But I get what Jack's saying. If he's paying for that section and they change the name where those people may have shared in that, and now they won't have to because it's the main Wignall or close to that anyways. You just want to spread the pain into people that you are also, you're paying for them, but they're not paying for you. 
Is that kind of the? It's, it goes further than that yeah. because it will happen all the way down to the connection where the Michener was attached to the Wignall back in 1934. Right. Yeah. Okay. okay. I'll ask questions? Mr. Marsh that. Thanks. Okay. Great. Thanks, Jack. Any other questions? <coughs> Let's go to my last slide. Thank you. Thank you. Our next delegation is Harry Wells. Good evening, Sorry. Mayor, Council, staff, uh, those watching here present and uh, those at home watching. Um, uh, I thank you for the opportunity to express my concerns regarding the design of this um, flow. Um, I have a couple things, first of all, before I start, just to make a, a comment. I was expecting to have the clicker to be able to control this. Uh, I can't control this now. Uh, so it's going to be a little awkward as it goes through it because the timing of what my presentation has it has animation in it it's, it's going to be it's going to be awkward and it may cause a little bit of an extension of my time up here but we'll give it a shot we'll see how it goes Sammy if you want what we're talking about here is the, um, the report that was just uh, issued in regards to the uh, Port Coburn drain, uh, I heard some things new tonight that were not in the report. Uh, so my my presentation here may have uh, some things that uh, don't apply, but it may have things that do apply even more so, and the significance of them may even be more important. So uh, on with it, if you will. What we're talking about here is a. Um, a drain which has some uniqueness to it. The uniqueness to it is the connections to the quarry. Although the report says the quarries aren't connected to it, they aren't connected by runoff, they are connected by pumps. Pumps that don't have to be shut off. Pumps that can run 24 hours a day. Uh, these quarries that we have here were blasted craters, huge craters into the earth and remove the earth. So these are retainment, retainment areas. Next. So we have pit two and we have next pit three. So if we go a little deeper into these, um, there's a very uh, significant amount of time spent in the report um, in regards to the significance of the impact of these quarries uh, on the drain, um, but it's not quantified. The report, in fact, on pages 5, 6, 8, 10, 13, 15, and 16 identify areas and ex give explanations for the modification, alignments, and abandonments of, this, of the quarry and how they impact the drain. But that is not discussed in the report uh, significantly, uh, if we can. If we look at pit number two, and again, the uh, pit number two, if you look at it, the total area is 73.2 hectares, which is actually 22% of the watershed. That's a significant number. Um, and this has a volume capacity, and this is what I mean by a volume capacity, it can retain 9 million cubic meters of water. That's a lot of water. And that can pump 9 million cubic meters of water into the drain. So that's a significant thing to, to understand. Um, when we come to it. Uh, if you click again, please. What we're looking at is the, the pit has a bottom to the pit. We heard Mr. Marsh earlier today state that he made some changes. He would like to make some changes to pit three because it's no longer farmland. It is quarry. And I'll get into that a little bit later. But uh, the bottom of pit three is bedrock. It's hard, it's concrete, it's light concrete. It, it's there, and, and it doesn't absorb water. It holds water out. Uh, next click. The, uh, the buffer area exists between the blue and the red line. It's a very small amount of area. That's a berm. The berm flows one side and the other side. One side goes into the quarry, the other side goes into the roadside ditch, which roadside ditch ends up going into the drain. 
So virtually all the water of the quarry that gets into the quarry comes into the quarry and gets there. The drain on the, the, the bottom of the quarry actually has a slope to it. And pit two has a slope which is about five meters from end to end, running from the north to the south. Click please. So you can see it. These are elevations that are actually taken from the expansion documents that provide are provided by Port Gorman Quarries. Next clip. Now let's go through Pit 3. It's the same sort of scenario. Pit 3 is this, this area. It has a total, um, capa uh, total area that uh, is um, uh, 70.6 hectares um, and that, that uh, represents uh, another 22% of the watershed. So combined, you're looking at 44% of the watershed out of these just two little areas that we're looking at. Um, if you click again, please. Again, the buffer is a very small buffer area, um, and um, it, it doesn't have a very significant, uh, significant runoff because half of it rolls into, flows into the quarry, the other half flows into the roadside ditch. Um, Click again, please. Again, the bottom is hard base rock. It does have a slope to it. Click again. And you can see here, these are from the, the datum that's uh, from the expansion. Uh, it has a slope of about three meters. So, and these, these slopes are sloping in the quarries to the pumps, the pumps that are used to extract the water out of it. Next. <clears throat> if we were to look at, the, the issue with it is the ground water flow infiltration. And if we look at it, from the perspective of it, this dike, this picture is in the wintertime, which really shows the water that's infiltrating into the quarries. Um, the base of the quarry is at 166 meters above sea level. Water table is at 178 meters, and the top of the ground is, is at 182 uh, meters above sea level. So when we look at this, there is actually 12 meters of water that could be retained in those quarries. Um, this will vary slightly from location to location in the quarry and quarry to quarry, but uh, there is a significant amount of inflow of water into it which the quarry must handle. Next slide, please. If the quarry, as you look at it from here, were to not have the pumps, next slide, this is what would happen. It would fill. Whoop. Click again. Okay. Not working. What would happen is it would the quarry would fill. So what they have to do is they have to pump the quarries down. Next slide. There, that's working. So now they pump the quarry down. But when they pump the quarries down, they don't only pump the water inside the quarry down. The water from outside the quarry is impacted. In fact, it's impacted to one kilometer away from the edges of the quarry. Next slide, please. And that's a significant uh, importance because it's not only the water in the quarry that's being drained, it's the water outside. Click again. Here are the quarries. Click again. And there is the distance out that the water is being pulled from. Click again. Now, they have a permit to take water. These permits to take water do not have uh, daily, uh, daily requirements from the perspective of can't, you can pump on Sunday, but you can't pump on Monday. You can pump when it's raining, but you can't pump when it's sunny. They don't have limits to that. The only limits they have is the quantity and the quality. So when we look at these, these permits, they have one permit for pit two. The permit for pit two is eight million liters per day. Could be raining, could be snowing, could be melt on the ground, the drain could be flooded. They can pump this any day of the year. Click again. Pit 3 has two permits to take water. And Pit 3 has the ability to pump out 10 million liters per day. And again, that 10 million liters a day is not limited to any aspect of the weather or any aspect of what's happening in the drain. You heard by Mr. Marsh say that, well, they don't pump out. They don't pump water into there when they're experienced peak flows. Well, that might be a question 
that I will show you a little bit later in this one here. Um, my concern, though, if you click, please, Dan. Thank you. My com concern is based on the drain capacity and the consideration of the, the water that's being pumped out of the quarries into those drains. And that is not part of these factors that are used to determine that. Next slide, please. So if we look at those factors, the area contributing to the runoff, 143.8 hectares, uh, or 44% uh, of the watershed, significant volume. Um, in fact, it's the largest contributor to the drain. There are no other ones. Even valet's properties don't contribute that much to the drains. And, um, you look at the quarry, um, at the land as it relates to runoff. Well, there really is no runoff from the quarries. Nothing significant. It's all pumped. It's not natural runoff. It's stuff that can be turned on, turned off when they want. Um, the land topography. I showed you there the quarries. You heard from Mr. Marsh uh, that the quarry at the bottom is rock. There's nothing there that absorbs water. Only stuff there that allows the water to pass out, pass down to the pump and to be pumped off. Um, um, I'm sorry, Sammy, if you go back, sorry, my, if, uh, if we look at the portion of hard surface versus soft surface, well, from the report, it's my understanding that uh, the ratio is 80, 81% versus 19%. And what that means is that, the, um, respectively, the 19% are the burned properties, which actually 50% of that 19% feeds back into the quarries. So the ratio, if you're looking at it truly in, in comparison, is higher than 81% hard surface. And that's important because that determines how much water is going to come off of that through the pumping. Uh, stormwater management. There is no stormwater management systems within the quarries. They collect it, they pump it. That's all it is. Very simple. They don't do anything to reduce the runoff, and in fact, if the quarry wasn't pumping in the groundwater, there would be less water going into the drain. They're actually adding water to the drain that the drain would not normally have. And that is 19 million liters per day that they could add. They may not because they don't have to, it's already pumped out, but they have that ability. So it's not a storm, it's nothing that reduces runoff, it actually increases runoff or contribution to the, to the, um, uh, to the drain. Next one, please. Um, <clears throat> there is what's referred to as the coefficient of runoff or the C factor, and I, it's, in, it's important because um, this is part and partial of the prediction of how much runoff would come out, out of that. Um, but that is based upon runoff. It's not based, based upon pumping fly volumes. Um, and um, so this, We'll enter into a little bit. I won't talk about this any anymore in that regard. But it's important to note that um, if you click to the next one, one that, more minute here. One more, one more minute, please. Okay. Um, click to the next one. The the C factor of sixty, which was referred to in the calculation of that, um, it's really not sixty. The if you go through the reports, click again. There are three places in, uh, three additional places within that, click again, within the report that identify and use a lower C, fa or C factors than, click again, again, and again, and again, and again. Here's one at 35. That's not 60. Click again. Click again, and again. That's right in pit three. Click again. How does pit three have a uh, C factor of 35? I don't know. Uh, click again. This one, click again. 20, 30, click again. Now it's in the middle of pit two. How can middle of pit two have a C factor less than farmland? I don't know. 
Click again. This is in pit one. Pit one's not even supposed to be part of it. This is in the report. And it's right off, right, the source will come up right now. Click again. There's the source. That's right in the drain report. There's these three properties. Click again. Or these three locations in there that are all C factors less than, less than 60. There's three with 60 and less than 60. Click again. Oh, that was, if you go back one quickly. It's very important to note that even the roads, the MTO road right away are 90 to 80. That would be similar to the bottom of the quarry. Asphalt, concrete, bedrock, same sort of full characteristics, characteristics of water. They should 90 or 80, and that's the C factor they're given, not 60. Click again. Okay. Um, click again. I'm going to go to questions here. All right. Okay. Oh, oh, just one quick click, 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 click. Oh, right there. There, well, that is during a huge rain event, March 27th, 22. Pit three discharging. They were discharging. They were not observing peak flows. My property flooded that day. Click again. They are discharging again. July 17th, 21, another flooding day. So there's nothing that controls when they pump. And that when they pump, they can pump up to 20 million liters per day. Okay? Great. Thanks, Harry. Okay. Questions, Council, for this presentation? Council Bob. Through you to, to Harry. Harry, um, what are the questions you want answered uh, with this presentation? I, there was a lot of, you know, difference, or a few things different from what Mr. Marsh did. What, if we look to send this back, what is the two or three things that are, you know, wrong? The, Thanks, Ron. The, the biggest thing is in regards to the ratios that have been established. Um, okay. What was used by um, EWA was a ratio of 50-50 for a, the, the highest flow and the lowest, uh, the highest C factor, which they've assigned 84, which I believe is a lot less than what it should be. It should be in the 90 to 98 area uh, compared to the low, low ratio uh, that they had of uh, 35 and 35 again um, I don't know where the 35 would apply to their lands I can't see it um, so the, the questions that I have or, or that I would like to to see at, responded to are the uh, what is the true C factor what is the true volume of water that the drain can handle from those quarries so that that would not provide um, and that enable the flooding of the properties downstream of them. That's the biggest concern that I have is that I heard and I just heard it tonight it was it's not in the report <laughs> that was presented and it should be is that they check to see if the flows from the quarry um, would the, the drain would be able to handle them. I, I, that's the question there is will they be able to handle them during peak flows? Um, is the is the drain actually designed for that? Council, yeah. all set. Okay. Any further questions? Great. Thanks, Harry. Thank you. So, councilors, did, uh, I knew some may have questions for the consultant. I think you did, and Councilor Bonner did. So I'll have Mr. Marsh come back up in Atlanta. Councilor Bruno. Worship, um, just two questions. One was the first one, the significance of uh, the renaming of drains, if you remember. Um, does that, how does that affect the uh, apportionment? And we heard Mr. Halinga's answer. Just wondering if you could respond to that, the name change issue. I'm going to let Alana start with right. that explanation, sure. and then I'll maybe add 
little bit. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so the naming, uh, the name changes were brought about by the previous drainage superintendent um, who had done some history himself um, and you know, determined that you know, this could possibly be Port Colburn at once outletted through what is now the Vale property. Um, so all of that was just, we, we let that roll. Um, I didn't make any changes from what the previous drainage superintendent had um, set us in the path of. He was a historian, not me. Um, Mr. Hillinga is a bit of a historian himself, um, but we just kept on that same path. As far as we saw, the name changes, yes, may be confusing for the residents, um, but as far as the drains themselves go, um, having a Port Colburn drain, a Wignall drain, and a Michener drain, um, to me and to those involved at the time, seem much more logical than having W1, W2, W2A, 2A, 2A, 2B, um, it was, there were too many branches and we just made things a little bit simpler. The Port Colburn drain drains into the Wignell drain, the Wignell drain flows into the lake. Councilor. So to circle back, um, then the name change, obviously at the end of the day, there's money involved in this and what people are gonna be assessed. So I guess the question is, um, Mr. Halinga, from what I got from him, that the name change is important vis-a-vis -vis what's a tributary, what's a main drain, and I'm assuming that that culminates in a differentiation of costs, and I, that's what I want to try and find out, because I, I really can't. The, the name change to me just doesn't jive in my head as how it's a different um, cost. So from my perspective, I don't care what it's called. And it won't change what Mr. Hellinga's assessment is. Mr. Hellinga's assessment is based on a tiered model connecting within the drain. So the very top part is what we're calling Porch Colburn Branch Number One that runs along two sides of his property. He will pay for that drain. That drain empties into what we're calling the Port Colburn Branch, which we're proposing, or Port Colburn which we're proposing to extend along the east side all the way up to the second concession. And it becomes the biggest piece of the drain that will exist in the future. <coughs> he will pay for that. He will pay a larger share because all of his property is within that watershed. That Port Colburn drain outlets into the Wignall drain. And when I bring the Wignall drain report forward, uh, Mr. Halinga will pay again, as will everyone within the Port Colburn drain, for the portion of services the Wignall drain provides to them upstream of where it connects. For the work that is north of that connection, they won't pay anything. But for the work that is south of that connection, they will pay a share. And so Mr. Halinga is correct in the sense that where something connects can determine how much it gets paid relative to the branching of the drains. Okay. In the case of the Port Coburn, there's only two parts, the branch and the rest of it. I didn't subdivide the rest of it into two sections, three sections. I left it as one complete watershed. I didn't feel it was necessary to split it up more than that, in part because most of the costs for any new changes or works are being borne by the quarry or for the culvert changes by the city. The culvert changes at the time that we looked at it, um, uh, I, I, you know, we had survey data, that was what made the most sense to us. We all reviewed it, that's what we wanted. It switches the flows to the east side on the north side of the second concession, that's what we did. Thank you. The second question is going to be to Mr. Wells's point. I guess all along I'm thinking if there was no quarry there and it was hard surface or farmland, it would have a runoff and it would go into a drain and it would be part of all that and it would be assessed its cost. So until the end of Mr. Wells' uh, uh, presentation, which somewhat um, maybe negates this question and answers my concern. So 
The fact that the quarry can pump at any time does seem to be a salient point. But otherwise, is the quarry not holding water, much like in the urban area, a sewer treatment reservoir holds it till it can get treated and doesn't overflow. So if the quarry's holding the water, isn't that a good thing until the flows stop from the rain event and then it can eject the water, ergo you don't need a bigger drain and ditch because it's not all pouring at the same time. But I, I did take note of the final point. If they can pump at any time, then they could overflow it. So can they be controlled as a check valve or um, reservoir so that you don't have to expand the width of the drain? That might be pretty long-winded. I, I hope I got everything in there well, and you I'm, understood it. I, I'm going to try to answer and I'll do it um, with an analogy. Let's say the quarries were all farmland and they run off. We know how to predict that. We know how to size the drain. It's not a, a huge technology to do that. Let's say that instead of farmland, they converted it all into parking lot, no excavation, they just paved over everything, and it was connected to the drain. In that case, yes, we would assess a C-vector of 95 or 98, because they would have a gigantic amount of runoff that's appearing in the drain. That's not what they're doing. What they're doing is creating a giant hole that acts in a way like a stormwater management pond because it traps all the water that falls within the boundaries that Mr. Wells outlined, and it doesn't go anywhere <coughs> until they pump it. That's right. And so that's what I'm trying to balance with the C factors, is recognizing they're somewhere between agriculture, which they are not, like 35 is what we use for an agriculture, and 80 or some 95 value, and we took the median of that, the middle of it, and that's what we gave them as a C factor. Is it high enough? Is it the right number? It's a number. We came up with it that's a reasonable thing for what we took, which was 35 to 85 and the middle 60. So if Mr. Wells thinks it should be higher, okay. Um, I thought 60 was okay. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Bonner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to uh, Mr. Marsh, I guess. Um, so I get the C factors, and I get that it could be 60 or it could be 70 or whatever shakes out. Um, Mr. Wells showed us three or four pieces of quarry land that were 25, 30, 35 as a C factor. Is there an explanation for that? <laughs> no, I don't, I, I don't have an explanation of that because I looked at the report, I looked at my mapping, mine say 60. So I'm not sure where his numbers are coming from. Uh, I have the tables with me here, I can look at it <coughs> again here, but I checked it a couple times and they say 60. So, okay, so, so the one that doesn't is the one that he identified that's in pit three, that at the time that I was looking at it was <coughs> more not pit and more agriculture, and in the intervening time, that's more pit than agriculture, and I would like to change that at the quarter revision to also be a 60 along with everything else. Okay, so the 60 versus 30 C factor can be handled at the quota revision. Yes. Okay. So like, even if we check the report and the numbers are as Mr. Wells says, mm -hmm. and I haven't done all the changes I should, we will make them all 60 at the quota revision. Okay. If, like, assuming that you all agree that 60 is a reasonable number. Sure, sure. Um, so I guess I have trouble with the 60 number because I'm no expert on that number, I don't think anybody else sitting around here is either. Uh, we rely on the engineer to come up with a number. If someone wasn't happy with that number and they wanted to challenge it, 
I don't imagine the court of revision is the place to say that. Is it the next step, like the tribunal, or, or is it the court of revision? I think it's both of those. If someone's not happy, the court of revision is the place to challenge anything to do with assessments. Um, if they're still not happy about the report or about the assessments, the tribunal is the avenue by which they would pursue that unhappiness. Right. And, and again, originally, um, this was assigned to the, well, the first consulting firm as one report to do for the entire Wignall drain. It was that engineer went bankrupt because he was having so much fun working on the report and it was assigned to a second engineering firm and they didn't finish it and I took it on and we chose to split it into three reports in the hopes that it would be less of a contentious issue to go all the way to tribunal. Uh, we, we thought that was a good strategy and I still think it was a good strategy but it might mean three trips to the tribunal instead right. of one big one. Right. So can the drain handle the amount of water that the quarry is pumping up? Yes. Based on what we looked at from the pumps that they had on site at the time that we looked at it two years ago um, and looked at the nameplate with the rating for how much that pump is meant to produce and making some assumptions about how high they're pumping the water <coughs> and from where they're pumping the water the values are within what the drain can be support based on a prediction of a runoff from an agricultural area directly connected to the drain. So the, their pumping should not overwhelm the drain. Okay. And um, I guess I'm, I'm uh, not surprised, but, but um, concerned that the quarry can pump during rain events. Is there some kind of a agreement or something that says they won't? And how do you slap them if they do? Yeah, so that's, uh, when we've talked to them, they have clearly stated that they absolutely never pump when it rains. Right. And, and so uh, if the, the permit to take water is a Ministry of the Environment issue. It's not a drainage issue. Mm -hmm. And there's, a, there's another part that I, I appreciate Mr. Wells and his presentation on hydro G impacts for the, for the quarry and the volume that the pumps deal with being distinct and different than peak runoff. The drainage act is really set up to deal with sizing the drain for a peak runoff. And that's really kind of how assessments are done. Volume where they pump less but longer durations. There isn't really an impact in making the drain bigger for that. There can be other impacts where the drain has to deal with the velocities that those pumping operations cause in the drain that aren't normal compared to regular runoff. So the drainage act as it's currently set up is more suited to looking at peak runoff. Um, we would have to bend and push it a little bit to deal with volume impacts over time. I asked OMAF, uh, the advisory group that they have about this, what has been done other places to deal with quarries. There wasn't a very good answer. It doesn't, they didn't say, oh, do this, because that's what's been done. There isn't, a, a, that they could tell me, a precedent that I can turn to to say, here's how we handle this. Okay, and, and just to pick up on Councilor Bruno's, uh, question on the name of the drains okay and you're saying that whether we name it whatever it will not change Mr. Halinga's assessment when you also bring the Wignall forward so Correct. any of those name changes aren't going to affect what he pays no no okay and we set up the names based on what made sense to us looking at the way the drain is today. So I appreciate the history that uh, Jack has put together. Um, Henry's history is included in the baseline report. And we really, we really just, you know, because I was the third engineer on this, mm -hmm. we just took that, put it in the report. 
We didn't really spend a whole lot of time questioning what Henry had done. We wanted to move on and get some other stuff done. So okay. we're really looking at the way the drain is today and how we'd like to manage it in the future. And using these three names, the Michener for the shortest <coughs> piece, Port Colburn for the westernmost piece, and Wignall for the middle made the most sense to us. Okay. Um, so if the quarry takes up 44% of the area, and I, I taking that from Harry's uh, graph, are they paying 44% of the cost if you take out the city and the MTO and everybody else? Like, so are they paying their share? <laughs> so they're paying for the part of the drain that's being extended, which is the majority of the work except for the 2016 work that was previously done in the lower reach, which had a debenture against it with the insurance uh, and the administration, which includes my fee, the other engineer's fee, and whatever else is put in it. They're paying 100% of the cost for the extension, plus a portion of that engineering fee that went into that, which, you know, it's done on, on ratios. Mm -hmm. And so are they, are they paying their share? I think, I don't want to say yes or no, yes. because I can't tell what's their share. Yeah. Right? Like, but, but we have a reasonable methodology for giving them the amount of costs that have been calculated. I haven't budged anything to bump it up or make it lower. It's a straight mathematical calculation. They have this C factor, they have this much area multiplied together along with everybody else. They pay 100% of the cost of extending the drain plus 50% of moving the culverts. The city picks up the rest. All the rest of the costs get packaged into one thing, and that's spread amongst everybody. Right. So if, because I'm cognizant that every time we send it back, you're sending us a bill. Us. You're sending the watershed a bill, right? Yes. Um, and that was evident from this sure. time coming back um, that things weren't reduced because there's more engineering fees in it. If it was to go back, you'd be charging more engineering fees. And I guess we got to decide on charging more fees to fix what is, what's, what's the benefit, the cost benefit maybe. Yeah, so they're, they're, when we draw the line and it collects properties, some properties are a tiny sliver. Sure. And the calculation is that they're less than four bucks in the scheme of things. We drop those. We don't include them because it's a mathematical map anomaly and it's not worth chasing four bucks. The postage for staff <coughs> to send out the request is going to cost mm -hmm. more than that. Right. So we drop those and it, it's kind of a similar argument that if we refine this to hit the bullseye and it costs more money to do that, are we really achieving anything? Right. So if we were to send this back for Mr. Helinga's concern about the name change. You have to give me a name to use. If you right. Are, if yeah. You yeah. That's, that's what I'm saying. If, if we send it back to you, you're going to send it back with what you probably named it. No, I'm not making up a name. No, no. What, what it is now, let's say. What you had in your report. Right. I thought that was a pretty good name when yeah. Alana came up. Or I, have, came up. I have no idea on names other than history. Um, sometimes tells you that it makes sense to do this. And I guess in 20 years, everybody that's around there will know the name, whatever it is, right? So I'm not trying to make light of it. I'm just trying to get my head straight as to how much energy should be put into the name, the name change. If, if you tell us the drain can handle the flows out of the quarry, then that was one certainly of Mr. Wells' concerns. And the other, the other concern where those oddball ones, uh, properties of the quarries, if they are a C factor of less than 60, the um, next committee that they go before, the quarter revision, can clean that up or 
tell you to clean that up, or you'd probably have that cleaned I'll, up I'll before it got the there. Table for our intervention at that right. Meeting. And then, if the court of revision decided that sixty wasn't the magic number, but maybe sixty-five was, then the court of revision could make that change. The I guess if the quarry didn't like it, they could go to the tribunal. If some of the residents didn't like it and thought it should be 70 instead of 65, they could go to the tribunal. So there is a, a next step, and I know both Harry and, and um, Mr. Halinga, Jack, he, they don't really want to go to the tribunal, I'm sure, because the tribunal is a whole other thing. And I'm sure there's a cost to it. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Harry, Harry, I think, has been there, and Jack, maybe. Um, so to get it fixed before it even gets there is the key to to everything, I think. <coughs> I just can't. I can't see what good it would do. I, I I should stop and let other people talk if they have a. Sorry, I'll stop here, Mr. Mayor. Let maybe somebody else is more Thank intelligent you. than me that can come up with some ideas here. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, <coughs> aside from Councillor Bruno, I'll go to other speakers with his name. I like where Councillor Bruno. Sir, thank you. I like where <coughs> Councillor Bodner is going to avoid this and coming back, which just increases the cost for everybody else, parties that aren't even here or, or have that. So un under the provisions, is there like in other um, scenarios, is, is there mediation? Is there an arbitrator? Lana? Court of revision and the tribunal. Is there an opportunity to sit down and resolve this? Is there a third party referee? Can both sides agree to accept a third party um, call on this? Through you, Mr. Mayor. So the three steps are the court of revision, the tribunal. If there are still issues, there is a referee. Um, I've never been to the referee. I hope not to go to the referee. Um, the, the referee will only deal with legal matters as uh, to the way the act has been applied within the report or consideration by council. Can we get that on the yep. 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 Uh, that again, Mr. Mark? The, the referee will only adjudicate legal issues within the process of adopting the report or through the tribunal or mistakes made or uh, the application of law. So the, the, the referee is really a question of legal matters, um, whereas the tribunal is a question for the report content, design, how it suited the resident's needs. And uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councilor Bruno, um, when, when we are presented with appellants and the tribunal, Alana and I go to them and say, what can we do to make your concerns be addressed? So in the past, on the Zavits, we did that. Actually, Alana was one of the appellants because I was working for Fort Erie at the time. And so we changed and satisfied, and so they dropped their appeal because we addressed what their concerns were. But one appellant was not happy with what we were trying to do, and so we still went to the tribunal for that one appellant. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councilor Baggett? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And listening to everybody talking here, I think we're, uh, I'm ready to send it a quarter revision. I think it's, uh, we're not going to solve anything more here tonight. i sending it back to the engineer's report for the, the 60 factor in the naming. Uh, I'm not willing to send it back to the engineer. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Okay. No further questions at this point? Great. I do have to ask if there's other public though. You guys can sit down. Uh, is there anybody else in the public that wishes to speak on this issue? That's impacted by the drain, yes. Uh, sure. Yep, come on up. Just name an address for the clerk. Joseph Van Ruven. Oh, yep, press the red button. Joseph Van Ruven, 787 Highway 3, Port Colburn. Um, I live where the uh, the, 
whatever you want to call it, the drains, come across Highway 3. The, my, my property is immediately across the street from Jack Halinga's. And um, I will just comment on a couple of things that have been presented here tonight. Uh, I will say, well, without any kind of exaggeration, there are times, certainly when it is absolutely pouring out and the drain is being pumped from the quarry. So wh whether they say they never do, I'm not sure what they're using as a guideline for what is heavy rain or what, but I'll tell you right now, there are times my property is one of the properties where there's a ford across the creek, across the drain. Um, I had a, um, a bridge over there at one time when they cleared the drains last uh, in 2016. They asked me to remo remove the bridge that I had put there, so I did, and they were going to put a ford and, a, and across. I've since had to um, substantiate that ford because the stones that were placed in place were sinking into the clay, and so I had to put some more in there. So now I've got a ford that I can get across. But I can't bring my tractor across when I have my bush hog on the tractor because it gets right buried in the water. If the pump is going on to the quarry, I can't get a bush hog across the back two and a half acres of my property. So um, I wait, and um, I'm not one to squeaky, be a squeaky wheel, but I'm, I'm saying that what the Port Colton quarries people are claiming in terms of not pumping during the uh, heavy rainfalls, I would say is absolutely false. What I also will say is that since 2016, when the drains were last cleared, uh, the amount of vegetation growing in the, in the drains has substantially grown, and the, the, uh, it's not the uh, phalagmite uh, australis that's causing the problem. It's regular uh, cattails, and when the pork bowl quarries is pumping, that drain is as full, I bet it's up to my hips. And normally, I mean, when it's regular drain, uh, just water coming off the, the grounds. If, in fact, the quarry is not pumping, then uh, the water across the drain uh, might be up to a, a pair of uh, rubber boots. So um, I can still walk across it. But because so many times, so much of the time now, is um, the water is up to my hip at least, I have built another little footbridge across the, the creek so that I can get across and access the back half of my property. Um, so th that's one thing I want, wanted to comment on. Um, with regards to, uh, it seems there's a little bit of confusion and or um, people are taking things uh, in different divergent directions, but I'm thinking that anyone, um, like the, the quarries represent to me a reservoir. Rain falls, if it falls vertically, it's gonna be filling up those quarries. And I can understand the owners of the quarry want to pump that water out of there because they're working in the bottom of that hole. They need space to work. So they're gonna be pumping that as soon as they can. If they have too much at the bottom of the quarry occupying water, then they can't operate there. So that every day of uh, lack of operation means a day that they can't be making money. And so I understand why they want to pump during a rainfall, but I, I understand that they said that they wouldn't. But so one or the other has to be true. Either you're going to be doing it or, and allowed to do it or be told you not to do it and then be held accountable to that. And there has to be some kind of penalty because I'll tell you, before the drains were cleared in 2016, um, the, the, there was a lot of blockage, but there was a large volume of water already coming down the drain and it had directed a new channel across my property, across my neighbor's property, beside the drain, because the drain was full, so full of uh, weeds, there was some water flowing down there, but it had now come up across my property and across my neighbor's property as well. So there is a lot of water coming out of that quarry, and that 20, roughly 20 million uh, liters per day is a huge volume, and I don't know what that looks like in terms of 24-hour uh, flow, but it is a huge amount of water. So if the water's falling straight up and down in a regular rainfall and it's filling up that quarry, uh, whether they're pumping it immediately or they're susp suspending their pumping so that it pumps while it's dry out, um, it, um, ultimately what you're doing is extending the, the length of time that it would otherwise flow. When a lot of water falls, when rain falls on my property, I don't know what the factor is, but there's a significant amount of, my, of that water that penetrates the soil, ends up on the bedrock 12 feet down below the, the surface, and then flows along the bedrock. In the quarry, it falls on the quarry and it stays there until somebody pumps it out. In addition to that, 
the groundwater never stops flowing. As one of the illustrations in one of the in the uh, slide presentation that either Mr. Wells or Mr. Helinga presented, you can see on the wall of the quarry the water flowing in. It was frozen because it was an in, a winter image, but that water is flowing 24/7 every day of the year from uh, forever. That quarry, uh, the aquifer, is constantly flowing into that quarry. So not only is the Porcom Quarry is pumping water that is falling in there ambiently from the sky, it's also pumping out what's coming in there through the aquifer. And so that in itself, it doesn't matter how much space they're occupying, 44% of the, of, the, uh, of the land area of that drainage basin, to, as far as I'm concerned, they're responsible for 44% of the, the water coming down the drain past my property. And um, so what flows off my property is only a small fraction of what doesn't penetrate. Very, very little water flows off of my property into the drain. What's flowing, what, when it rains out or snows, it, it sits on the surface for a period of time, but eventually just dis disappears. It's not flowing into the drain. But Port Colvin Quarry is 100% of what falls on their quarry and what is coming in for, from their aquifer is coming down my drain. So who... Uh, uh, technically, I would just say if, if someone was responsible for p uh, the water that's flowing down, the wa down towards the lake, do it by volume. There's an enormous amount of water coming from the quarry, and they should pay for the use of that drain. Anyway, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Any questions? <laughs> questions? I don't think so. No? Okay. Anyone further? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Council, we do have a, a motion here. Uh, the Public Works Department Report 2022-250 be received, and that the Mayor and Clerk be directed to execute a bylaw to pre provisionally adopt the Port Coburn Municipal Drain Engineers Report, dated July 12, 2022, prepared by Paul Marsh, P. Eng of EWA, Inc., under Section 78, Chapter D-17 of the Drainage Act, RSO 1990, and I need four councillors, uh, three that will be appointed as members of the Program Missile Drain Court of Revision, and one councillor be appointed as an alternate to be tentatively scheduled for January 25th, 2023. Do I have a mover and a seconder for that? Councillor Baggu, Councillor ba uh, Bruno. Uh, councillors, who wishes to sit on the Court of Revision? I have Councillor Bodner, I have Councillor uh, Aquilina, and I have Councillor Baggu. I need a fourth for um, uh, an alternate. Alternate. Uh, Councillor Hoyle. So Bruno, Aquilina, Baggio, and then the alternate is. Uh, no. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Did I say Bruno? I apologize. Your hand was up so much tonight. Um, Bodner, Aquilina, <laughs> Baggio. And Hoyle are the and with Hoyle being the alternate as counselors. Any further questions? All those in favor, please raise your hand. That's carried. Now is nine point five. Committees and Boards 2022-264, uh, that Development and Legislative Services Department Clerk's Division Report 2022-264 be received, that the recommendations contained within this report and the Board of and Committee Structure attached as Appendix A of Development and Legislative Services Report 2022-264 be approved, that staff be directed to report back to a future meeting with an updated Board and Committee appointment policy, that staff be directed to report back to the future to a future meeting with updated terms of reference for all advisory committees to support the approved new committee structure. And the staff be directed to advertise for lay member persons for expired terms in accordance with the board and committee structure attached as Appendix A and the city's boards and committees appointment policy. If I could have members uh, Elliot and uh, Danch move this. Um, questions on this? Councillor Bruno. Uh, thank you, Worship. Uh, I'd like to propose a friendly amendment. Uh, we 
did talk, and the report speaks of ultimately getting to a three citizen, two um, <coughs> counselor um, uh, li limit. Um, and so uh, uh, I think that, um, as was asked many a times, what was the origin of a predominant council versus citizen representation? And I think the answers were given that satisfied historically why it was, but to move towards more citizen um, representation and see how that works, including citizen training um, and orientation. So to that end, I'd like to propose that we reduce and try and get to that goal by doing th um, uh, uh, three um, municipal uh, representatives and two citizen representatives. On the Committee of Adjustment, correct, Councillor? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'll do official, or I'll do a, a moved and seconded amendment to that. It's a little bit more friendly, I think. Uh, if I could have you and Councillor Bagu move that uh, the Committee of Adjustment has three members of council and two members of, of the public, and that the uh, clerk will change this. Any questions on that? All in favor of that? That's carried. Just the amendment. Just the amendment, yeah. Okay. Now, we're back to the motion, uh, main motion as amended. Any further questions on any of the committees? Seeing none, all in favor? That's carried. <coughs> this is a long one. Council representation on boards and committees for 2022 or uh, report 2022-270. That the development and legislative clerks division report 2022-270 be received. And that staff be directed to report back to a future meeting with council member appointment to committee policy for consideration and active transportation committee that Councilor Bagu be appointed. Economic development advisory committee, Councilors Elliott and Bruno. Environmental advisory committee, Bagu and Hoyle. Grant Policy Committee is Hoyle and Aquilina. Park Auburn Historical Marine Board Museum is Councillor Beauregard. Park Auburn Senior Citizens Advisors at Council, Councillor Aquilina. Social Determinants of Health Advisory Committee, Everyone Matters, Councillor Hoyle. Committee of Adjustment, Councillors Elliott, Beauregard, and Bruno. Property Standards Committee, Notice to Muzzle Appeal Committee, Councillors Beauregard, Hoyle, Danch, and Aquilina. Park Auburn Public Library Board, Councillor Bagg. Downtown Business Improvement Area, BIA, Councillor Elliott. Main Street, BIA, Councillor Danch. Drinking Water Quality Management System, Councillors Elliott and Bruno. Niagara Center, Dorothy Rungling Airport Commission, Bruno and Bodner. Park Orman Wayfleet Chamber of Commerce, Councillor Hoyle. Julia Yeager, Social and Recreation Center. And Shirkson Community Center, Councillors Bodner and Aquilina. Niagara Transit Commission, Councillor Beauregard. That's it. If I could have Councillors Beauregard and Hoyle move that. Any questions? Did you say uh, the Community Center? Well, it's called the Julia Yeager no, that's, oh, Social and Recreation oh, Center. Sorry. Yep, I, I did them both the same because oh, the two count. Okay. Both of you are on both because you're both in Ward 4. Yeah, I did them both in block, Counselor. <laughs> I was just making sure you're paying attention this evening. <laughs> So I have Councillors Beauregard and Hoyle moving that. Any further questions? All in favor? Let's carry. Item 9.7, recommendation report for a draft plan extension to the Rosedale Estate Subdivision 2022-257. Um, we have uh, Development and Legislative Services Department Planning Division Report 2022-257 be received. And the Council approve a one-year extension to the Rosedale Estates Draft Plan Subdivision. And the Council delegate the authority of the Manager of Planning to consider a further one-year extension to the Rosedale Draft Plan Subdivision. If I could have Councillors Dan and Bruno move that. Questions? I have uh, Councillor Aquilina first. Uh, through you, Mayor, uh, I guess my question is, if we are going to do an extension to Rosedale, um, is there any um, 
anything that we can uh, stipulate that the developer needs to do in order, you know, to substantiate the extension. Certainly. Or at the end of the extension. Okay. I'm going to go to Mr. Schultz on this one. He's online. Uh, so, David, you heard the questions with regards to what staff's expectations are with regards to the one-year and possible uh, further one-year extension? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Councilor Aquilina. Um, staff have proposed uh, a one-year extension at this time, um, and for that one-year extension, we're proposing that the applicant uh, submit a red line revision within that time frame um, in order to be um, considered for a further extension uh, following that one year. Um, with that red line revision, uh, there will be updates to the plan that are forthcoming, um, and those will incorporate the new design changes um, that the applicant is proposing. Uh, I will note that the applicant uh, is here and should be making a presentation as well. Uh, so yep. I'll just uh, I'll leave it at that. Okay. Does that answer that question for you? And we uh, do have Mr. Kernahan here. He will give us a presentation. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Mr. Kernan, come on forward. Just press the red button there. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, members of council, staff, and uh, members of the public, if anybody's listening. I'm, I'm cognizant of the length of the agenda that uh, council's been through this evening, so I, I will try and keep my presentation brief, uh, but, but direct. So. I would like to take a few minutes to speak with you regarding the Rosedale Estate subdivision. Um, I should mention my name is Matt Kernahan, and uh, I'm here on behalf of uh, Mr. Rotella, who is the owner of that subdivision. Uh, next slide, please. So the Rosedale Estate subdivision received its draft plan approval back in 1988 from the region of Niagara. Um, what that meant, as it does for any subdivision with draft plan approval, is that provisional approval to build houses in this location is currently in place. So in simple terms, a set of conditions are set out that need to be met in order to build the subdivision shown on the plan. These conditions include things like needing to finalize the design of the water mains, storm and sanitary sewers, as well as the roads and grading within the subdivision. The conditions also include things like detailed studies that need to be done, uh, in particular things like an archaeological assessment. Once all these conditions are filled, the owner, fulfilled, the owner can then apply to have the subdivision registered and can begin construction of the infrastructure and houses. The provisional approval was assumed by the City of Port Coburn in 2007, and it has a time period uh, attached to it. This time period has been extended by the City Council on a number of occasions over the years. So getting to the reason why it's taken such a long time to, to fulfill these conditions of approval, I'm going, to be, I'm going to be very frank with Council. Developing the subdivision is very expensive. It costs a lot of money to pay the engineers and specialized consultants to complete their studies. Then once all these studies are complete, the developer needs to install all of the municipal services, water mains and roads at their own expense. This is very costly. Making things even more expensive in Port Coburn is the fact that bedrock is very close to the surface, as many of you know. Until very recently, it was so costly to do that what was necessary to develop this subdivision that it didn't make financial sense to do it. It simply cost more to do it than the lots in the subdivision were worth. Next slide, please. So notwithstanding the cost, progress on this subdivision was made over the years. Mr. Rotella and my firm, um, much before I was a part of it, up to and including now that I am, have been working away at bringing this subdivision closer to the finish line. Work on clearing a number of the conditions of approval has been completed. This work has included detailed engineering design of the municipal services in the subdivision, detailed studies including a traffic impact assessment, noise study, and a very lengthy and costly archaeological assessment, which is still underway, have all been done. Most recently, Mr. Rotella and UCC have been undertaking consultation with the city and regional staff on how best to move the servicing and development of the Rosedale subdivision forward in light of some changing circumstances. Next slide, please. In particular, there are two major things that have changed since the Rosedale subdivision was approved, and these changes need to be adapted to through the development process. The first critical change is that the Ministry of Transportation, who has control over Highway 58, will no longer permit a road connection from the subdivision to Highway 58. That means two things. Firstly, it means that the subdivision plan needs to change to remove this road connection, 
And secondly, it means that this subdivision is now very closely dependent on the development of the Meadow Heights subdivision next to it. The second major change also relates to the Meadow Heights subdivision. In particular, the parcel of land now owned by Van John Paving immediately to the north of the Meadow Heights subdivision on Stonebridge Drive. At the time when the Meadow Heights and Rosedale subdivisions were approved, this parcel was owned by the city. In fact, the sewers and water mains that service a portion of these two subdivisions have a provincial approval to be constructed through these lands. Unfortunately, despite this approval being in place, when the city sold the lands, an easement over them was never secured to ensure that the pipes could be as in constructed in their approved location. So this presents a bit of a complication for the development of these lands. So in order to overcome this complication of these two obstacles, the approved Rosedale subdivision needs to, needs to change before it will be built. Next slide, please. So while we are working through the necessary changes um, that need to be done in order to adapt to these changing circumstances, um, we will also be working to improve the Rosedale subdivision. Our intention is to modernize this plan by increasing its density and introducing new housing types that will approve affordability for the future residents. Re recent changes in the market and to interest rates have made housing affordability even more important than it was in the past, and we intend to adapt to make sure that this, house, this subdivision includes affordable housing, or housing that is more affordable, I should say. So our intention is to work with city staff over the next year or so to make these important changes to the plan and secure the necessary development approvals. Um, as is indicated on the screen, there are a number of um, specialized studies that we know need to be updated. And Mr. Rotella has, also, has already retained the services of, uh, of my firm, Upper Canada Consultants, to undertake the servicing work at a significant cost. And more significantly, he's retained an archaeologist to undertake the stage three and four archaeological assessments, which we now know could cost, will cost him over $700,000. So there's a lot of work that's required to do these detailed studies and to justify the changes and to figure out how best to service and develop the subdivision in light of the changed circumstances. It's very important that we retain this draft plan approval while we figure out this together with city staff. Next slide, please. Our request of council this evening is very simple. We ask that you grant us a two-year extension to the draft plan approval. This two-year extension will give us the time we need in order to make the necessary changes to the subdivision so we can get it built. We are closer to the finish line for getting the houses built here than we ever have been, and we ask the council not set us back by letting this approval lapse. Circumstances and market conditions have changed, and we have needed to pivot a bit but things are moving in the right direction and we need to maintain our draft plan approval status to keep things moving that way. Respectfully, on behalf of Mr. Rotella, I ask that council grant us this two-year draft plan extension this evening. Next slide, please. So that concludes my presentation. Um, I would like to thank council for your, your time and, uh, and our, your consideration of this request. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Mr. Kerr. Council, do you have any further questions? Um, through you, Mayor, to Fulton, um, I guess, um, how will we know in the two-year extension, like, how far you, you're moving along? Like, do you know? <laughs> yeah, so, th through you, Mr. Mayor, um, making changes to, to a subdivision and, and acquiring the development approvals is a bit of an iterative process. Um, we work very closely with city staff, and there are steps in that process where we check in. Um, the, the first of those steps is something called pre-consultation. Uh, that's where we develop an updated plan and we submit it to the city and the other review agencies for, the, uh, for their, their feedback on it so we can get sort of our, our marching orders to move forward with the application. Um, so the planning department will be aware of that because we will submit an, an application um, to them. So that's sort of the, the first step. Um, then what happens is we, as the owner and the consultant, we go away for a while, we do the homework that's been set out for us, and then we, we come in with an application. Um, and along, during that time frame, we, we do check in periodically with, with city staff, and in particular, if council was interested in, in an update on our progress between pre-consultation and application, they could, they could have 
planning staff reach out to us and uh, and ask for it. But um, to my initial point, it, it's a collaborative, iterative process that that you know, your staff would be uh, involved in all along the way. So they they would have an idea of where we're at. Councillor, all set. Great, thank you, Councillor Baggett. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I have no questions for the presenter. I just have a comment okay. afterwards. Thank right. you. Councillor Bruno. Uh, thank you, Worship. When I um, read the report, I can see the balance and I can see the direction where the city's going. It wants to get um, drop plans off the ground, and it also wants to see, I would think, substantive progress. So I'm going to ask the um, consultant, what would you, con I mean, it sounds like you I don't know if Mr. Retello has engaged a $700,000 contract, but um, maybe this has got to be shared, Mr. Mayor, uh, with, with David. Is But what is, developers want certainty, and so not just for this development, but going forward, what is considered substantive action or work that satisfies the planning department to keep this going because you know is it subjective um you know maybe through you two if, if david can answer this is it you know is it the red line um re re requirement is it uh is it that mr Rotello has signed agreements with three um uh, consultants and he's paying out this kind of money I think everybody is going to need to know whether it's two years or this iteration that's being proposed is what's what says to uh, the developer and to the city's satisfaction that that is substantive work so uh, maybe I can ask if you've had that conversation with the city and and David if that can be defined because if people know where the goalpost is you either cross it or you don't that's right Mr. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the Councillor, I, I have not had a, a direct conversation with Mr. Schultz about what he considers to be substantive uh, progress. Um, it seems to me, by reviewing his report, that the expectation is, and, and based on his comments er earlier, that the expectation is, is that we would um, submit a, a red line revised plan. Um, but, but I don't want to put words into his mouth. Perhaps I'll, I'll defer to him. Okay. Mr. Schultz? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, to Council. Yes, that would be correct. Um, that's what we have proposed as a solution for this. Um, I would think that the, the red line revision would definitely give a substantial, you know, thought about the progress on the file um, because these design changes are necessary to actually move this forward. Um, and certainly, uh, to Councillor Bruno's point, I think a financial commitment uh, in the area of seven hundred thousand dollars is certainly uh you know a, a it's proving that the the developer is wanting to move this forward um i'm not sure if those can be shared with the city i'm, I'm not too sure at this point um but um certainly the red line revision is where we see uh some some movement on this councilor bruno um, maybe circle back if you have other yep. any further questions for mr kernahan Councillor Dantzler, Councillor Potter. Uh, yeah, I, oh, just a question. Uh, educate me. What is a red line revision? Mr. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, a red line revision is is a a change to an already approved draft plan of subdivision. So, um, for instance, if we wanted to, which we do, introduce um, townhouses into the into the development plan. Uh, we would submit a modified plan that showed lots for townhouses where single detached dwellings currently are. And, and it, it's an application that would also be accompanied by a zoning bylaw amendment application and it would be uh, subject to council's uh, decision. Thank you. And then, and I read the uh, letter that you had sent down there. This archaeological uh, third stage thing, like, Far we have to go with this. We obviously, we obviously, you've done it one and two. Now you're going to a third. 
So three, Mr. Mayor, in order to satisfy provincial policy um, and um, city and regional planning policy, uh, you need to clear, it's called, you clear the site of further archeological potential. And it's basically, you need to keep looking until you stop finding. Um, so stage one and two assessment has been done. That stage two assessment identified a number of sites where there is a cluster of archeological artifacts and the stage three assessment will um, dig up those artifacts, assess them for significance and, and count the density of that site. Um, if after a certain period of time they stop finding that site, can that be cleared at the stage three through the stage three process. Mm -hmm. If they keep finding at high density, then it needs to move on to a stage four. And um, that's, that's where you, you um, do a further assessment. I, I, I don't want, I can't get into the details of it, but it, you have to go to a stage four if the amount of artifacts warrants that you go to a stage four. Um, and uh, these things are very costly uh, just to pick up on another point that was made. Um, so Mr. Rotella has engaged the services of an, ar of an archeologist. The best case scenario is $700,000 for this site. So there's the, the time and materials required to mitigate the sites that we know about right now. Uh, that's $700,000, the best case. Um, we don't know if a stage four assessment will be required until the stage three assessment gets underway. Unfortunately, due to changing weather, we couldn't, despite having retained the services, we couldn't get into it this fall. But um, the intention is to begin those assessments in uh, the spring, late April, early May, when the ground becomes dry enough uh, to do that. So, Councilor Botter. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to the presenter, just because I, maybe I wasn't paying attention again, but I think I was. Um, I heard you, I thought I heard you say you're looking for a two-year extension, but everything I re read and I thought I heard David say a one-year extension. Can I just get the, because I thought it said one year in ours too. Can somebody so, tell me what it is? Yeah, so it's a one-year extension that we approve. Yeah. And we're giving our director of planning the ability to give the further year as long as they're satisfied yeah. with regards to the work that's being completed. So right off the get-go, it's a one-year with a... Good behavior gets yeah, so you another year. It, basically, so instead of it having to come back to us again, yeah. and it goes to what Councillor Bruno asked, and what Mr. Kernahan and David <laughs> answered, um, as long as the staff is satisfied, they'll automatically get the second year. Yeah. Good. Thanks. Okay. For the questions to the speaker, <coughs> Councillor Elliott. Thank you, Mayor. And this would be through you to our planner. If um, you're satisfied that uh, things have been moving along, um, come towards the end of the first year and want to extend it to two years, is the second year end full stop? Yeah. Or do we go for another extension after that? Because if this has been on the books since 1988, that's 34 years. When is enough enough? David? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, through this council report, as staff have recommended, um, only the additional one year would be uh, permitted through this report's approval if council approves it. Um, any further extensions would have to then come back to council uh, for approval. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Further questions to the speaker? Great, thanks, Mr. Carnan. No, I know. No. Okay, questions or comments to staff? Councillor Bruno, then Councillor Baggett. Um, thank you, through you to Mr. Schultz. Um, David, so in the iteration that you propose of one plus one, is that two applications and two fees to the city and two fees to the region? David? Uh, for you, Mr. Mayor, uh, typically that would be the case, yes. It would still be a formal application. The approval would just be held at the staff level. 
Councilor Bruno? Um, if this was stated later on in the year one, you determine the red line's done and yet the <coughs> archaeological has started, and you have the authority then to extend, what would be the reason for a new application and a new set of fees if you're not writing a report to council um, and the work is done in your mind, um, what would the cost be? Because you're going to then give the go-ahead and I don't know whether it's note to file or what, but what costs are there for the city and the region to warrant? I guess I should have asked um, I, I'm understanding that the city's cost is around 1600 and the region is uh, a fair bit more than that, so to say it's five or $6,000. But paying that the second time for when you may feel everything's done just seems to me to be um, a lot of money to pay for what you will now have the straightforward line to approve. I don't know if you have any comments on that. Mr. Schultz. You could see that as, a, as, as, as not needing the second fee if the work's been completed. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, that's a good point. Um, and certainly if council uh, decides they can choose to waive that, uh, the city fee the second time around. Um, unfortunately, there still is the circulation of the application that still has to be done uh, where it has to be circulated to the Niagara region for comments. Um, their fee, I, I, like I said, I think it, I think it's in somewhere in the neighborhood of two thousand, maybe twenty five hundred dollars, um, and I, I don't believe that fee would be waived by the region, um, and and that decision would have to come from them if that's the case. Um, so that 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 formal process still is done. Um, it's just saving it from coming back to council, I guess, which would um, reduce the staff time uh, it takes uh, from the city's perspective. Um, thank you. I, I think in that regard, I mean, my concern, um, uh, 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 it, it was brought up that, you know, this has been a long time going, but to let this lapse would mean that the whole project dies and whether you could even get it or not, a whole new draft plan would have to be sought. Is that correct? David? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, yes, that would be correct. If uh, council chooses not to extend it, um, then the approval would lapse um, and a whole new application would have to be uh, started. Councilor? Thank you. Um, given that double hit on fees, given the 700,000 um, that we understand is expended, given the red line promise that it will be done, um, uh, I will support a full two years. Um, I, I may have been persuaded to on the double uh, uh, line, but it just doesn't seem to me to be um, equitable um, to double the fee if you're already committed to $700,000 plus. So I will be supporting the request by the developer's consultant for two years. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. That will take an amendment, Councillor, to the motion that's on the floor, but I'll go to Councillor Baggy first. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, uh, this is probably the third time I've been on Council has come here. Uh, 34 years is a, is way too long. I, got, I, I was fed up the last three times I came to Council, and I'm just as fed up even more coming back now one of the reasons is market conditions have changed. Well, market conditions have changed in 34 years. That's pretty well guaranteed, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> COVID, that was only a couple of years. We got 32 more years that's been covered. Uh, as for the uh, access to 58 entrance and exit being denied by the ministry, I thought we heard that last time they were here. Mr. Bear, that it was refused. But I'm not quite sure, but I've heard it before, so. And uh, every time 
it's coming to council. It's costing us staff time, region time, and uh, I think we've, we've just been taken advantage of, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I don't think this subdivision is going to be taken serious. I don't think it's going to be built before uh, this new council ex term expires in four years. I think we're going to be the same exact same spot as we are right now. And uh, the presenter, you know, is only telling council of their problems and uh, not any progress. The progress he hired somebody was $700,000. Well, the guy hasn't done any work yet. So, uh, Mr. Mayor, I will not support this extension whatsoever. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Any further questions to staff or comments? Seeing on, Councilor Bruno. Your Worship, I'd like to put forward an extension given the money that's being expended and the promise made to uh, do a full two-year extension, uh, given it'll take some time to do this. Thank you. Can I get a second to that? <coughs> Councilor uh, Danch? Does, does the manager of planning still reserve the right to do it for a year after the two? So, Councilor, with regards to that, so in, re in, re in essence, we were giving one and one with the manager of uh, planning um, to give that. So you, you want to take that out, just leave it at two? So that will come out. So, okay. All right. So the council delegate their authority to the manager of planning because it's a one-year extension. Yeah. So that last line comes out. Okay. Questions to the amendment? Councilor Bob. So be doing the two-year, that eliminates that second payment to the city and the region. Am I Correct. right? Right. Yeah. Okay. Further questions? Clarification? This is on the amendment only? I do, Councillor Danch. Yeah. Okay, so the amendment only to amend the motion that's on the floor to two years and taking out paragraph three. Everybody understand? All those in favor? It's carried. Opposed? Okay, that's carried. So now to the motion as amended. The Development and Legislative Services Department Planning Division Report 2022-257 be received. The Council approve a two-year extension to the Rosedale State's draft plan of subdivision. So that's already on the floor. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Opposed? It's tied. It's defeated. So we're back to the, well, it's denied. We voted on the amendment, which passed. Which was the two years. Which was two years. Yeah. And then the motion to go to two years was defeated. Well, yep, yeah, Councillor, ask a question. Is this the second? Because I advanced the first motion for approval, and it was uh, to, to go to two years, and, and it was approved. Then the second motion isn't two, is it, it's not two years, it's one and one, is it not? It's two years. You're, you're giving a two year. Right. Because you're taking away what staff was going to do. Or you would have left it as it was. Right. So you're just giving a straight two years, which as you and huh. Councillor Bodner said, it eliminates the second application for fees to go to the city. Correct. And the region. And so it eliminated paragraph three, which gave delegation you don't want to do that because then there's still fees to be paid. Right. So back to the main motion, yeah. So the main motion was tied 4-4. Now, <laughs> Councillor Pepper, were you an error in that, Councillor? Um, I think I'm just really confused with the differences between the two. And okay. So, so, so I'll, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's I fine. No, no. I apologize. Yeah, no, that's I, fine. I, so, yeah. so, so the first motion that was on the floor, or the motion to get this on the floor was to give the proponent one year and then only a second year, but delegated to staff, and then there still have to be a, a fee payment for that second year if staff was convinced or um, if they were in agreement that work was progressing to what they liked, to let, to let it go to a second year. 
<coughs> Councillor Bruno had, had amended that to state we're going to withdraw the second year uh, for staff and just give the straight two years. So it's one permit fee, which would that's how it would be normally. They pay the permit fee to the city and the region, and it's for a two-year extension. So after that two years, they would have to do it again if they wanted to extend it or if everything's uh, gone through and, and, and been approved by staff and the subdivision moves forward, it moves forward. If they come back after two years and ask for another extension, again, then they would have to pay another fee to the city, another fee to the region, and staff would go from there. But staff would make a recommendation whether they were going to agree with it at that time or not. But that's two years ahead. So, in remove, so on the amendment, you voted in favor to remove the one in one and accept a two year straight with one fee. Okay. Right? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. So the the second motion So the so the motion goes back to the floor as amended. Okay. Okay. So that we we've taken out what originally was put on the floor. We've taken out paragraph three which gave delegated authority to the staff. Right. And just gave a straight two years. Which has been done in the past. It could be three years, it could be one year, but this case, Councilor Bruno's asked, instead of doing one and one, it's just go ahead for two years, get your stuff done, get the subdivision moving, and then staff would, would as I say, it, it could be ready to go and shovels are in the ground after two years because all the work has been done, or they may be coming back for another extension due to some reason. It could be the archaeological reason, it could be servicing reason. I, who, who knows, because we don't know what's going to happen in two years. Staff will tell us at that time, if they come back, what work has been done to date and if they're satisfied. Okay. Am I allowed to change? So I will do that part? only because okay. this is your first meeting and <laughs> you know you are a new counselor. Bye. It's only fair okay. because okay. It, it was it was confusing. Okay. So, so I'm going to call the vote again if that's fine. Yes. Okay. So everybody knows. So the motion on the floor is to allow... Uh, the report of 2022-257 be received and the council approve a two-year extension to the Rosedale Estates draft plan of subdivision. Stop. That's it. Okay. All those in favor, raise your hand. All those opposed. So it's still tied 4-4. Okay. So the motion is defeated. Right. So now we go back to the main no, that, that, was that that's the motion as amended. Okay. So. Sorry, it's 4 4? Yes. So, Cou can all counselors oh, declare a conflict of interest? That's fine. No, I know what you're saying. Yeah. So I, I looked at that and I, yeah. So this, so this, the motion of one in one with a fee could be put back on the table, right? Can be put oh, back on the table. I'll move it. So you're going to move. I was going to say. Well, that's okay. Oh, go ahead. Go, go ahead. Okay. I'd like, like to make a motion to go back to the original um, um, policy that we were going to do. Okay. So the original motion on the floor is that Development and Legislative Services Department Planning Division 2022 257 be received. The council approve a one year extension to the Rosedale's estate draft plan. So, Division. The council delegate their authority to the manager of planning to consider a further one-year extension to the Rosedale draft plan of subdivision. And just to reiterate, everybody knows that a second application will have to be made, fees paid to both the city and the region. Okay. Do I have a seconder? Councilor Elliott. Questions? Councilor. So it is in order that I can propose the one and one without the fee. Sorry, I beg your pardon. Your Press it the wrong way. That I would like to do that. Without the, so it's one and one, without the fee to the city. And obviously, right, and obviously the third motion can be one and one with the fee. I'll, I'll go to the mover. Will you accept that as a friendly amendment to your motion? I will accept it. No, it's just the city portion. We can't do the region. It's up to the region. I'll accept. You'll accept that as a friendly amendment? Is that fine, Councillor? Is that fine with the seconder? Yeah, I'm good. Okay. Does everybody understand where we're going here? Okay, we can't waive the regions. All right. No questions? All in favor? Opposed? 
That's carried. So Denise, quick question to you. In a year or so time, the region may not be doing any planning, so it might that fee might be moved anyways, correct? Okay. Just so you guys know with the planning changes that are coming forward. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Mr. Kernan. Thanks, Ralph. Okay, item 9.9, .9, sale of surplus property, Steel Street 2022-253. <coughs> Moved by Councillors Bagu and Bruno, that Chief Administrative Officer Report 2022-253 be received. Council approve entering into an agreement of purchase and sale with Kenneth and Wendy Bush of 848 Steel Street for the vacant city-owned property on Steel Street. That a bylaw to authorize entering into an agreement of purchase and sale with Kenneth and Wendy Bush regarding the sale of the city-owned lot on Steel Street legally described as part of the Borden Avenue Plan 792 Humberston East Side of Knoll Street. Park Colburn be brought forward. The Mayor and Acting Clerk be authorized to sign and execute any of all and all documents respecting the sale of these lands. Questions of Councillor uh, Bagg. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Through you, uh, a little confusing this report. The cost of relocating the two catch basins on the allowance, who pays for that? Mr. Long? Oh, sorry, you want Brent? Sorry, I apologize. Mr. Cotton. For you, Mr. Mayor, to Council, the cost of, of moving the catch basins um, would be borne out of the cost of the sale. The, sorry, from the proceeds of the sales. Councilor? Thank you, Mr. Wade. So through you, the city pays for it? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, it, yes, it's it's being it's coming out of the cost of the the, the proceeds from the two sales of the, the, the two properties there. Councillor? So, just so I understand correctly, the money we get from the from the buyer we're paying it's gonna be used for the <coughs> to pay for the relocation. That is correct. Yeah, that, that's a moot point. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, previously property sold by the city has always been a condition on development of a building lot property must start construction within two years. We are selling a marketable property to Mr. Bush with no conditions that ever has to be built on so the city will get more taxes for a new development. So. Uh, I can't understand the reason that why we excluded that condition on this sale of property. Mr. Cotton? So, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I am a, have a little bit of a, a frog in my throat tonight, so I do apologize. Um, under our surplus land policy, uh, we go to the, um, uh, we make the first opportunity for the property owners abutting the property to purchase it. They made an offer to purchase the property. Um, and, uh, and, and therefore, um, that condition does not necessarily have to apply. Um, what we did do through the planning department was request that the buildable or a buildable lot uh, be maintained so that it could be uh, purchased in the future or it could be built upon in the future. Uh, but there is no requirement to build within two years uh, on this particular site. Councillor? Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Any further questions on this? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Carried. Uh, 9.10. Sale of land policy 2022-256. Moved by Councillors Bruno and Bagu. A Chief Administrative Office Economic Development and Tourism Services Report 2022-256 be received. The council approved the revised sale of land policy. The council authorized the mayor and acting clerk to sign the bylaw. Questions, Councillor Bruno? Uh, thank you, Worship. I'd like to thank the uh, CAO and uh, Mr. Long. I had a number of questions when first read the policy. Uh, uh, the last term of council, council members will recall 
that we were kind of dealing with an old policy and we learned along the way from both Borden and other land sales that there needed to be some policy and procedure tightening up. Uh, it was then deferred because we didn't have a red line version, if you recall, to see the old policy against the new policy. And now we do, thanks to Mr. Long. I went through this with Mr. Long and I had um, one, two, three, four uh, amendments, um, mostly wording changes uh, to this long policy. And um, I'd just like to just quickly go through them. Can I, to the clerk, can I say them as amendments, um, not to have to repeat it, if Mr. Long answers whether he agrees or disagree, it, it can be voted on in block, the four? Yeah, yeah, I can do that. Yeah. Okay. So the first one was uh, 2.4. Uh, so let me find it myself. Uh, land required for any municipal purpose, including but not limited to present to present or future municipal facilities, infrastructure, and parks, is not available for sale to the public. Um, I guess what I consider to be that we don't want to limit ourselves. It would still go through council scrutiny, but. In actuality, um, we broke what could have been this rule with Chestnut Park. So we sold a park for a dollar. So I went through that with Mr. Uh, Long, and uh, I wanted to get his opinion of it. So why don't I yep. ask Long? Uh, good evening. Uh, through you, Your Worship, to, uh, to the councillor and to council. Um, yeah, staff uh, have no issue. Uh, with that proposed revision. In fact, we would support that revision. And I think, um, you know, I think Chestnut Park is a good example. It's a great example of where, you know, council uh, and a community stakeholder work together to uh, identify a critical need in our city and then went and repurposed uh, a city asset for greater community benefit. And I think as we look ahead to this council term, um, and this was touched on during some of the council orientation presentations and, and during the recent Committee of the Whole presentations on the budget, is that during this coming term of council, uh, we will be doing a review of our assets, a, re a review of our facilities, a review of our infrastructure, a review of our parks. And uh, there may be some instances where uh, it makes sense uh, with the support of a business case to divest uh, some city assets. In other instances, it may make more sense for us to retain those assets and invest in those assets. But I think, to the councillor's point, I think uh, we would support, staff support that proposed revision because I think it's important for council to have the flexibility and the decision-making authority um, you know, when we have those instances. Um, and because we are a public entity, and we follow the principles of good governance, which are openness and transparency, among other things, you know, there would be a public report yes. coming to council. So <coughs> staff are okay with that. So in that regard, Madam Clerk, it would just be removed because it's not like we're gonna do it, but we have the right to do it and we have to make a case to council and the public to do it. So it would be easier just to eliminate 24 we could remove that from the policy. Okay, thank you. Um, if there's nothing else, I'll move on to 2.5. 2.5 was a pretty straightforward one. Any survey and or reference plan required shall be obtained at the expense of the purchasers unless council by resolution otherwise determines. I think certainly in the last term, when we bring development or put things for sale and like to cut to the chase, we should do a survey and pay for it and get reimbursed in the pricing of the land so that someone who wants to buy something from us, his first question is going to ask, well, you know, I need to take the survey to my uh, contractor or to my planner to see if we can do it. I think we have to have done the survey. It's going to avoid a lot of steps. And I don't know how Mr. Long feels about that, but maybe he could comment. Uh, through, you, uh, through you, Your Worship, to the Councillor staff, our support of, of, uh, of that revision. Okay. Councillor next. Oh, yes. Through Your Worship, 
to Councilor Bruno, are you suggesting? Are you suggest? So, sorry, are you suggesting that it doesn't require a survey? Any survey no. and or reference plan required shall be obtained at the expense of the purchaser. Unless I'm saying council we should be determines shovel ready, sale ready. So, so if we put something up for sale, we we do the survey sure. and it's the cost is included in the purchase price. So through your worship, not not, not, yeah. not included over. So if it's a hundred thousand dollar lot, and the survey was five thousand. It's a hundred five thousand dollar lot. So through or you listed at one hundred five. Right. So through your worship right. to Councilor yeah. Bruno, like I don't I don't read two point five with timing in question. <clears throat> I just think it's saying if and when the survey is, was, will be. I think it's, <clears throat> I don't think it's a, sorry, I got the same frog Bram has. Um, through your worship to Councillor Bruno, I, I don't think the turning point is did we get a survey in, in time to market the property good. I think the turning point is if we did get a survey, it ought to be at the purchaser's expense unless council <coughs> deems otherwise. So I'll use the example. The wrong I'll, use the, I'll use the example is um, I come to the city to buy our surplus land. It has no survey. So you say to me, I'm the proponent, go get a survey. You want to buy the land. So I go do the survey. I either decide then not to buy it after I take it to my consultant. And the city ends up with a survey. And the next guy ends up with the survey who comes in line sure. to bid. So I'm just saying, don't you want to make it easy for the buyer to make a decision? If it's $2,500 on a $100,000 or $200,000 property, it seems a delay. And the obvious question is going to be asked by the buyer. I want to know what I'm buying. Sure. So through your worship to Councilor Bruno, I don't think it's broken 2.5. Apologies to Mr. Long. I'll let him state his opinion. The way I'm reading this and, 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 and saying it in my own words is we should get a survey. The city yeah. should get a survey, which is what you want. Yes. But that survey is ultimately going to be paid by the eventual purchaser. So sure. if we have a vacant building lot in two, 2022, go get a survey. If we sell it in 2025, the, the, the acquiring <coughs> party can have it. It's been on file for three years. But the acquiring party is also going to pay for it in the purchase. I don't think it's a. I don't think there's a person at the counter saying I'd like to buy the vacant building lot, and we're sending them away saying not until you obtain a survey at your own expense. I think our practice is to do our own surveys with a land surveyor, either when the when the property is declared surplus or when a sale is contemplated at the outset, or if it's an unsolicited thing where the person walks into the you know, walks into a meeting and says, you know, I'd like to look at this property. You know, that one we're not ready for, so we didn't have a survey on file. But in either case, we're going to get it from the expense of the purchaser. I don't think it's a case where we kick them out and say we're not ready because we don't have a survey on file. I, have I just think if we're... I have, second, oh, sorry. I have your answer, counselors and CAO. In the report under item 6.1 called land surveys, it actually talks about that. It talks about us getting a survey and not the third party the that person pays for it. I think 2.5 really talks to that, mm -hmm. that when we get our survey, they're still responsible to pay for it. The okay. two are tied to each other, so it's already there, but it is separate. Yeah. Through you to your worship, and I apologize. Um, when we discussed this matter earlier today, I didn't have the policy in front of me, so it is covered in section 6.1, as the mayor has indicated, with reference back to section 2.5, saying that cost will be borne by the, the purchaser. Can I just ask then why it's then even there? I think I know. All right. <laughs> Through your worship to Councilor Bruno, sort of a final word, contemplating what the original writers of, of the policy or the people who have added to it over the years might have been thinking. This is, it's a total different track. This is council having a chance to write off the cost of the survey for a valid reason. So imagine a property was undesirable to us, but desirable to the neighboring property owner. And imagine its value was very low, $100. And imagine the survey was $2,500. There would be very little incentive for the person to pay 20, like they might cut, kill the whole sale because of the order of magnitude of the cost of the survey, but it might benefit 
all of the taxpayers of Port Colborne for the city to divest itself. So we're in a rock and a hard place situation, yes. all because of the cost of a survey locked into the policy. This gives council discretion. Now I would suggest you wouldn't want to use this discretion for, you know, uh, developers who intend to eventually uh, uh, benefit from the proceeds of sale of their subdivided parcels or, or what have you. But you might want it in a charitable case, um, a case where there's just a business case or a common sense reason. So, and I wasn't the person who wrote it in there, but I, I imagine that that's the rationale. I, I'm okay, fine. I just think if, 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 if we're confused in having this debate, yeah. why, why won't somebody five years down the road when none of us are here? But if, if that's the, still the rationale that will be packaged in, I'm good. Okay, next. Uh, 2.6. Council may impose conditions of sale if deemed appropriate. This is one I've argued right from the beginning that we should always have conditions. We, we have a rare opportunity when we have land, and I would argue we already have a condition when we sold one, and Chestnut Park is an example of it. Or you must build within two years. That's a condition we use. So I, I say by default we should always, who's ever per purveying this to the public three years or five years from now, it's a positive there is conditions because we may want to ensure that it's suitable to the neighborhood, right? It's there's could be many things, but there will be conditions. I just don't want it left that we can sell it with no conditions and everybody just moves forward instead of taking the sober second look. You don't have to take a sober second look if the default de facto thing is there will be conditions. So how do you want to reword that? Council will impose conditions of sale. If deemed appropriate. So can I jump in? Just uh, three words to, yep, three words to Council Bruno. Don't disagree. I'm sorry to step on your toes. Too long. Um, I don't disagree with the principle. I think the awkwardness comes from the fact that this is in general. So this is governing um, marketable, non-marketable, limited marketability, and so on. But in order to meet the test that you're trying to make the policy meet, I wonder if it should say, and I hope the clerk's writing because I won't remember this, <laughs> council will impose conditions of sale if deemed appropriate to protect the interest of the city, the, 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 the residents, or, or the, you know, and other stakeholders. If I'd be necessary. okay with that, if, but what about if it's a delegated authority so that it doesn't come back to us right. and the condition that the director told the buyer was, no, there will be no conditions. Okay, so can we make it a two-step, through your worship, two-step process and looking to, to, uh, to, to manage along who was at the meeting that uh, we've had today and last month about delegated authority generally. What if we say council will impose conditions of sale when necessary to protect the interest of the corporation or its stakeholders? And then in the staff report, we are going to bring in January, which we'll talk about delegated authority for lottery licenses and delegated authority for free room rentals for charities. We also put in delegated authority under section 2.5 of the land sale. So you're gonna have a month's time lag. Yep but we'll make sure that it's covered in the delegated authority policy. I'm good. Yeah. And then, oh, sorry, Dave. <laughs> Councilor Elliott. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. Um, through you, <clears throat> how do you leave conditions open-ended? So through your worship to Councilor Elliott, that's a good question. And I think it, it's that the reason I don't want too much um, shape in the policy I was a little bit, you know, alarm bells went off when the councillor brought it up. Is because each is, each case is different. It's, it's almost going to have to be looked at a case by case basis. So, for example, we had a property today that had city catch basins. The condition is that they need to be removed. Uh, the condition for building within 18 months or 24 months of acquiring a property doesn't apply if a person buys a 10 foot strip of land that abuts their backyard because they're not buying it for the purposes of building. So it almost has to be done by staff at the time of sale if it's a you know a church parking lot it's a lot different than if it's green space vacant residential so your, your question's valid i don't think i have an answer other than say you're right we can't stipulate the conditions so, in advance carte blanche 
just looking at it from a perspective of a residential lot, we would put on a condition that you have to build within two years, mm -hmm. full stop. So, so that's all. We're, that's all we're looking at. We're not. We're not going to throw conditions on where it has to be this style and it has to be that. Just full stop. You have to build within two years. So through your worship to Councillor Elliott, um, with zoning approvals and everything that are in place, yeah. right? I'll take it a step further. I'm not going to say yes or no, but I'll take it a step further. It's actually two years or a buyback at less than the face value, at less than the original transaction yeah, 75%, price, 75%. Yeah. But we have had, um, I can think of one property in particular, Walls, where we had received presentations from interested parties and they were almost like competing bids. I don't know if it's fair to say that, but there were different plans for the property and council sold it to a person who proposed a plan. And so the condition wasn't just, you must build. The condition was you must build what you proposed to council and council approved for that property. So it could go a step further than just the simple construction must take place. I don't know, and I, I mean, maybe it's wrong to predict the future. I don't know if we would ever say, you know, must be a brick single family home or must be a four story multi residential. We've done that. We've done yeah, we that. could. CMT. Yeah, we developed CMT. We had conditions in there about building a certain materials materials and things like that paving driveways all that stuff so yeah <laughs> not <laughs> and that took a while to sell right yeah like they that's the council the day did not want an all-sided house yeah and, and, and no, that's no snout houses like and no sure snout enough. houses and yeah yeah and those are those are the things that that make me very leery about limiting to what you can do uh, municipality to the extreme north of us that might abut Lake Ontario put extreme conditions on a, a piece of property that the city sold to a developer um, for affordable housing and they turned around and handed the keys back and said no nope, can't do it yeah so that's the, the situation yeah. I don't want to get ourselves into but CMT <laughs> is something we just came fell across because we purchased an old yeah. school property yeah so, but on, I just, to me, I, I one-off properties, unless it's more commercial, because that's what the Welland Street property came under. Normal single building lots, I don't think we've ever put a condition on what the house has to look yeah. like. And if somebody wants to lock themselves in and say, this is what I'm going to build, mm -hmm. you could put that in writing. No, yeah, sure. it's, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Just, <coughs> yeah, go ahead. Just through your worship to council, I think, I think, you know, the scenario we're trying to avoid is your, as a staff person is sitting across from an acquiring prop, uh, party and they say, oh, your policy says may, not shall. May is subjective and shall is very much defined. The new wording that's proposed, council will impose conditions that protect, conditions that are necessary or appropriate, whatever the word was, clerk, to protect the interests of the corporation and its stakeholders. Period. So there might not be any conditions on that 10 foot strip of land behind the shed that are necessary to protect the interest of the corporation and its stakeholders. Or maybe it's necessary that it's fenced after the purchase takes place because of the abutting landowner. Um, so, so there's sort of a spectrum there all the way up to and included. This has to be built on and it has to be built on within a certain time frame because that's council's expectations. So that gives us the flexibility to impose the conditions, but it also gives us the, the teeth to say to the person who's trying to avoid conditions for their own gain, to, to maximize their gain, no, 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 it says here we are required to implement these. So I think we're protected on both ends. Just to finish up, I actually invigorated my desire to have conditions because I can't think of a property, even the little slivers, that wouldn't have a condition. So in other words, if we sold the sliver for a dollar to get it off our books, we would say, but you must do the legals. Right. So like to me, it was really only a placeholder to not let the keeper of the policy think there could be no conditions. It, it, it makes them think that there must be something. You wrote this, so I, got, I need to go to the CAO and say, what do you mean I have to have a condition? particularly on delegated authority. But you have said you're going to try and clean that up there. Yes. But So it's not a hill to die on, but that was my 
in time. Thank okay. you. And one last one. Your last one? Yep. Oh, sorry. No, he didn't have a question. He's fine. Um, okay. The last one was, what was it here? 4.2. I think it may be a typo, but even that strikes me as a concern. Notwithstanding Section 4.1, the manager's strategic initiatives or designate may A, dispense with the requirement of an appraisal for the following classes of land. Land 0.3 meters or less in width, so that's about 13 inches. I, I don't think, I, I think you want to do it on something like 18 square feet was what Mr. Long looked at, right? That um, you, you have to have a realistic um, Number there would be nothing less than 13 inches. I know that's why I think I do. Go ahead. Through your worship to Councilor Bruno, I'm not 100% sure, and unfortunately she's left the room, but we could put a pin in this till she comes back. There's a concept under land division where there's a remnant parcel, it's a square foot that so when you do a severance, a consent to sever, uh -huh. you have a, re a remaining foot. It might mean it might me refer to that. Unless Mr. Long knows, I'd suggest we maybe ask, oh, she's coming back. <laughs> we might ask the manager of planning, or sorry, chief planner. Do you want to come up? Yes, I heard my name, but I missed the question. Sure, that's okay. Do you want me to read it? Or do you yeah, want go ahead. Yeah. So this is, uh, through your worship to, to Denise, uh, to Ms. Landry, chief planner, there is a section in here that says that there's no requirement for an appraisal on a parcel that's being sold that's 0.3 meters or less in width acquired in connection or an approval or decision under the Planning Act. And I wonder if that's referring to remnant parcels from consent to sever. Like when you get a square, is there a square foot concept? Can I say one thing, please, before you go? I think we have to remember that this is dealing with when there's an appraisal required for us. And, and I would argue that you want to have small slivers of land that we don't have to go to the expense of an appraisal. Like you wouldn't spend $3,000, right? right? To appraise uh, the size of Mr. Long's office. Right. Right. So that's where I think that was coming from. But. Sorry, Denise. <laughs> okay. through, through the mayor to the councilor, the, the 0 0.3 meter reserves, that's usually in reference to plans of subdivision. When a road, uh, when there's a dead end on a road, we put a 0 0.3 meter reserve so that uh, there's not legal access to the adjacent property. I agree with it, but it still says a, a pr uh, appraisal. Like, I think you want to not have to do an appraisal with properties that are larger than the end of the road. So it's, you know, Mr. Long's got all these properties that are this wedge, right? The size of your desk and all that stuff. Certainly we don't want an appraisal for that. So through your worship to Councilor Bruno, is it better to leave this and put a third bullet underneath A, uh, uh, an III, sure. that says uh, land where the value or the cost of the appraisal exceeds the value of the land? effectively doubling the cost of the transaction? Yes. Can the clerk remember what I just said? So it would be 4.2 sub A sub 3, Roman numeral 3, uh, land with, with an estimated value that, that less than the cost of the appraisal. I think, right? Yep. yep. Okay. <laughs> I'm good. Okay. Seven yep. All right. Done. Done? Okay. So there's three items, Council, that Councilor Bruno wants to amend. 2.4 he wants to remove. 2.5 is fine with. 2.6, taking out the word may and putting in the word will. And 4.2, adding another paragraph, paragraph 3, which reads... Uh, through your worship land with an estimated value less than the cost of the appraisal. Okay. Can I get a seconder for those amendments? Councilor Baggio, questions to the amendments? Councilor. Through your worship, I just wonder if uh, Mr. Kahn could just provide comment if he's fine with 
Oh, Mr. Long. Or Mr. Long. Uh, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Long, are you fine with these changes? Uh, through you, Your Worship, uh, staff support the uh, proposed revisions. Yeah. Okay. Councillor, you're all set? Any further questions, comments? All in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, it was carried unanimously. Thank you. Councillor Baggage, do you have any questions on this policy? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, one of the main reasons this was coming forward here that we forgot about was the uh, getting opinion of value any single independent appraisal from two different real estate businesses. Um, it states it in the initial summary to council, but in the Schedule A sale of land policy, I can't find it anywhere in there where it states you get a single independent appraisal and an opinion of value. Um, yeah, I gotta go before my computer knocks out. Uh, uh, part three, under um, <clears throat> E, all it says, obtain independent of property appraisals for land in keeping with any requirements opposed by any ethical legislation. And then under four, part four, which under is appraisals, all it says is one appraisal of the market value of land to be sold shall be obtained and prepared by the appraiser. There's nothing about the opinion of value that we discussed earlier, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Law? Uh, through you, your worship, to, uh, to the councillor. Um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, I think it is something that with council support, um, an opinion of value could be added to the sale of land uh, policy. Um, as the staff report indicated, um, what staff had been doing is, is obtaining an opinion of value and one independent appraisal. Uh, what we are always trying to do, certainly with infill lots, is to, is to, is to arrive at a, at a valuation of the asset that reflects fair market value. And um, we've been able to do that uh, through an, an opinion of value, which, which reflects you know, current market conditions and, and current pricing. Um, but we also feel that we need an independent appraisal uh, to give us that independent research and analysis. So um, it's staff's opinion that, that, that two independent appraisals is, is overkill. We, we feel we don't need two appraisals, but we feel that one opinion of value and one appraisal is, is adequate. If there's council support for that, and if there is, I think the council is right, we should just make that notation in the sale of land policy. Councillor? Yes, I agree with that, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. So you want to add in one appraisal and one opinion of value of market value of the land to be sold shall be obtained prepared. So uh, as an amendment, we'll add, put that in as amendment moved by you, seconded by Councillor Bruno, that we're adding under sections 4.1, it'll say one appraisal and one opinion of value of the market value of the land and to the end of where it already states there. Questions on that one? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, through your worship to, to Mr. Long, I just want to make sure council has a good idea of where we're taking them. And uh, this is your report, not mine, so I'm sorry to step on your toes again, but I want to make sure that we're okay. Are you suggesting both an appraisal and an opinion of value on every land sale, or it would be a single appraisal or a single opinion of value depending on the sale? I think we got to get it right. I know we have a current practice. I think if we, I think when it comes to policies, I'm sure you've heard this in staff meetings from me, we have to follow the policy we have and we have to, or the policy has to match our practice. Like if, if our practice today isn't matching the policy, it's okay that we, if we have a better practice to change the policy to, for the better practices. But I think I'm, I want to make sure council knows what they're approving. Is it 
an opinion of value and an appraisal together, or either of, either of those, but one, not two, that you're proposing? Mr. Law? Uh, through you, uh, Your Worship, to, to Council, I appreciate having the opportunity to provide some clarity. So what, um, what staff have been doing um, is that we've been obtaining an opinion of value and an independent appraisal for infill, developable lots, larger parcels of land for development, uh, for small, irregular-shaped parcels of land that might be the size of this council desk. Uh, we, we have a range um, that we use that's been provided by an appraisal appraiser. Um, so I think up until now and on a go forward basis, staff's recommendation is that we continue to obtain, we always obtain an opinion of value and an independent appraisal. That having both gets us to a valuation we feel reflects fair market value. Because yeah. appraiser appraisal is a lot more money than an opinion of value. Yes. Quite a bit more money. Yes. Yes. Councillor? Because uh, as the, most of this council knows, in the, as in the past, we've got an appraisal and then for some property and council has turned it down, asked for another appraisal and we get it and it's a lot more than the first appraisal, like $100,000 or whatever. So <clears throat> that's why I'm suggesting we get two, uh, Mr. Mayor. I agree. And I also remember a property that we had an appraisal on <laughs> was more. We went out and got three more, and they were all less. So, <laughs> I mean, it can go any, either way. Councilor Bruno. I don't know if you could give us some uh, context here, but I think the local real estate um, opinion of value is a couple hundred dollars, five hundred dollars. I think if you're going to sell hundred thousand to two hundred thousand dollar lot of developable land it's good to have a cross reference cross check yeah but i wouldn't go for two appraisals because i think no. that's just overkill yeah i agree okay so we have an amendment that's um moved and seconded that we uh, have the appraisal and the opinion of value any further questions all in favor that's carried thank you councillors any further questions on this No? Okay, so the motion is now as amended. Um, it's duly moved and seconded, correct? Who did I have originally? Uh, the amendments, oh, had, but nobody on the motion. <coughs> no, I did. I had uh, Bruno and Baggy. Bruno, no, Bruno and Baggy on the original to get it on the floor. So it goes back to the original movers. All those in favor? That's carried. That's okay. Uh, 9.11 TPH Academy at the Valley Health and Wellness Center 2022-258 uh, moved by Councillors Hoyle and Danch the Corporate Services Department and Recreation Services Report 2022-258 be received and the recreation staff proceed with accompanying ac sorry with accommodating the TPH Academy as a new tenant at the Valley Health and Wellness Center uh, Councillor Hoyle through the mayor to my buddy Brian. Um, with this uh, um, well, academy, hockey academy coming in, uh, just the concerns were about, uh, let's see, assurances basically that are elementary high and high schools and all our day users, even though I know there's not a lot of day users, but to make sure they still have access to their normal stuff. Walls. Yeah, through uh, the mayor to uh, council, uh, when we bring this forward, we have no intent to adjust any of the current day users, uh, the high schools, the elementary schools. Their intent is uh, looking to be Tuesday to Friday, and uh, we see it as not impacting uh, any of the uh, any of the current users. And We'll certainly work with that in the contract too to make sure that they understand that there's there can't be an impact on the current high school and elementary groups. Okay, Councilor. Yeah, basically, because I was looking at how the uh, besides London, 
the other places they have 8 a.m. to 4 and a whole course schedule with ice and everything. In London they don't do that, but they're in London at are later times. So I was just trying to make sure that we're going to stay in that time frame and then we're all good to go. And besides that, I'm perfectly fine with if the ice is not used, sell it. Sure. Get her going. Thank you. Okay. Any further questions on this one? Councilor Baggett. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I had the same question as Councilor Hoyle with the uh, parents and tots and the open painted play and senior and adult skate, but uh, I got the answer there. But also, I looked up our ice scheduling at the center, and it's pretty well closed every Tuesday except for one hour to do ice maintenance. So how would that reflect on this contract? I don't know what we do for ice maintenance for a whole day. Perhaps you can explain. Mr. Bowles? Uh, through the mayor to council, uh, we're getting a little more efficient on the ice maintenance, and we'll be able to accommodate it on the Tuesdays. Okay. Councilor? Any further questions? Councilor Borger? Through your through worship to Director Bowles, um, so uh, my understanding is that there's a priority list as to how we uh, deviate ice time. Uh, am I correct on that? Balls? Yeah, through the mayor to council, there is a model. Uh, minor hockey, for the most part, takes the ice time and then works it out through the various uh, groups, kind of working on the uh, on negotiating the the ice time. Uh, but the ice time that we're talking about here, uh, there is no taker of that ice time. It's just it it sits free and empty between nine and eleven on all those days. Okay, so. So currently, that's the situation. I'm just saying, if in the future, the priority is not going to change, correct? Uh, through the mayor to council, we don't plan on changing any of the priority with respect to who gets uh, that time. Uh, I know we said during the budget process that we'd come back and talk to council about different rate structures, and. Um, when we do that, we'll, we intend to also talk to council about other open ice opportunities and how ice does become open in uh, in the city, and look for council's comments on that at that time too. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you, councilor. Councilor Brown. Just quickly, here, both councilors really talking about do you, ice users have seniority? In other words, if you're minor hockey, if you're uh, girls hockey and you had this, these hours last year, you get first shot at it, so you don't want to disrupt their ongoing uh, method. Is, is that the methodology? Yeah, through the mayor to council, like that, that pretty much is how it works. It goes out to minor hockey, and we try to accommodate everybody under the same model that they had each year, and I can attest to this year, there was an attempt to make a change, and there was a lot of conversations amongst the individuals across the city. So ice time is a very complicated thing to, to divvy out, but the various groups um, definitely do their, uh, their, their fair amount of uh, communication to ensure how important their time is. And just like council know, I mean, only because I did this for a lot of years, um, with minor hockey being Pork Over Minor Hockey and Pork Over Girls Wave, they're number one. Junior was always number two. And when it came to playoffs, they got they could boot people off ice. And that's in everybody's contract. So if Councilor Beauregard has the ice Tuesday nights at at eight o'clock, but there's a playoffs now, and we need Tuesday because Orangeville's coming into town for a playoff game, we can tell you that that ice is canceled. And that's always been that way forever. So, I mean, it, it normally doesn't happen too often because as you go later in the year, you get less and less ice is being used specifically by minor hockey itself as they wind down. But minor hockey and junior always got first dibs with, when playoffs came. Your, most of your tournaments are set up in prior in advance, so when the, when the ice is divvied out, they know that the blocks for the Mayor's Cup, the Port Coburn Golden Puck, uh, a couple of the men's old-timers tournaments, uh, whatever, you know, Wave might have a tournament or Pork Over Minor Hockey may have a tournament. 
those are already blocked off before the year starts so people know that they're not playing that weekend. Even though they normally would, but they're not playing that weekend. And that's, again, been there a long time. So between ice schedulers and, and staff, it always is, is pretty good. So, But I'm going to applaud staff for getting this group to come in and use up ice again. That costs us money to have sit there, where now we've got a paying tenant. So just makes the the whole facility busier and bring some wanted money into the city of Port Coburn. So further questions on this one? All in favor? Carry. Is that it? <coughs> oh no. I got nineteen fourteen. Nine point one four. CAO use of delegated authority during lame duck period twenty twenty two dash two five five. Moved by Councillors Bagu and Elliott that Chief Administrative Officer Report 2022-255 be received for information. Councillor Bagu. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a minor point. Uh, I agree with the whole report, except I don't see anywhere where, I'll, where uh, the CAO, after using the lame duck authority, reports to Council, just gives an update to Council. Like it, do I take it for granted that he tells council what he's doing, or you know what I mean there? Um, through your worship to Councillor Baggio, that might be more of a clerk's question than a CIO question, even though it's my report and it's me who used the delegated authority. But uh, I think the initial intention of the report and the bylaw or resolution when it was passed before the election period started was that this would be the this is the closing of the loop this report so if there had been five or ten or fifteen instances where I had used it the delegated authority I wouldn't have reported each time I would have sent this report but you'd see five or ten or fifteen things on it this is the first council meeting since I executed those documents on behalf of the city so this this would be our first chance to actually say and I'll defer to the clerk if there's more if I'm wrong on that or if there's more to that Madam Clerk Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, to the councillor, the Chief Administrative Officer is absolutely <coughs> correct. Um, in the bylaw that was passed in July, uh, Section 7 does require this report um, from the CAO to council advising of any events relating to the exercising of his powers during that lame duck period. I'm good, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Further questions? All in favor? Raise your hand. That's carried. That ends all the business. There are no motions this evening. Any notices of motion? <coughs> None. I have two sets of minutes. The Port Colburn Public Library Board minutes of October 5th, 2022, and Environmental Advisory Committee meeting minutes of August 10th, 2022. Councillors Danch and um, Bodner, if you can move those. Questions to those minutes? All in favor, raise your hand. That's carried. Bylaws. We have bylaws 21.1 through to 21.9. If I could have Councillors Hoyle and Beauregard move those. Are there any questions to any of the bylaws? All in favor? That's carried. That's it. We're all set. You're all set, Madam Clerk. Great, thank you. Councillor? I just want to clarify, was there any of these bylaws that had involved my conflict? Uh, one. Yes, I apologize. Um, it is... <laughs> Sorry, guys. Sorry, I, I, it, was a, it was a bylaw that was added after the original bylaws. Just let me find it, because I'll go back to it. No, it's 21.6. 21.6? 21.6. Yeah, so bylaw 21.6 has to do with Rosedale which the councillor already declared a conflict. So I'm going to pull 21.6 to vote on this separately. All those in favor? Uh, so I need Hoyle and Aquilina to vote on this, or to, to move it, to put it on the floor. Um, all those in favor of that bylaw, except for the councillor. Okay, that's carried. Now the balance. Hoyle and Beauregard, all in favor. That's carried. You're, you're set, Eric. That was the only one. That was the only one. 
Uh, that was added late. What about the um, the Elm Street one? I'm not sure if that was a bylaw or not. I don't think it was. That was oh sorry we we yeah because we we passed that in uh, separately. We didn't pull that for separate discussion. And I don't know if we're in there. Yeah, there was no bylaw attached. No by to okay, it. so we're all set. Okay. All right, Council. So this is it for 2022. Again, we wish everyone a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Please stay safe. And at this time, we thank everybody for watching this evening and for those that attended. We're adjourned.